uh, uh, should we start? Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to this uh, second session of our mini colloquium on quantum thermoelectrics and heat currents at the nanoscale. Um, my name is Janine Splechtöse. I'm from Chalmers University of Technology in Gothenburg in Sweden, and I will share this session. We have today uh, two invited talks and five uh, contributed talks, and we will try to to be in, uh, keep to the schedule and be in time. If you have questions, then you have the possibility to do this either by writing your questions in the chat or uh, use the raise hand button that you find uh, close to this participant um, section. And then uh, you will be allowed to unmute uh, yourself and to ask the question. And um, uh, yes, with this, I think I uh, would like to uh, start the session and introduce the first uh, speaker. So the first talk is going to be given by Herr Kandlatsand from TU Delft. Please, Herr. Mm -hmm. I have to stop sharing. Okay, so good morning, everybody. I will talk about uh, th uh, thermal currents Coulomb diamonds. So that means that uh, if we look at yesterday, the ingredient that I will add to the thermal electricity is that we will have a gate to control the thermal currents in a small system. In this case, it will be a single uh, molecule. But of course, you could also do that for uh, uh, any other set or quantum dot. I've shown here already the people that uh, are the most important ones. And I've also only shown the young people. So, uh, uh, the young people that uh, contributed to this work. These are the people that, uh, the chemists, of course, who made the molecule, people who did the theory, and also people who did the calibration of our device uh, in the thermal, the thermal calibration of our device. I have a very special thanks to uh, Pascal, Pascal Gehring. You see him on the left-hand side, because without him, uh, we would never have been measuring thermal currents in, in my lab. He brought that subject to, uh, to me uh, as a Marie Curie uh, fellow. And uh, this is basically the result. And uh, the, the results that I will show today is what he uh, started up in the, in the lab. Okay, so if we go to the definitions, we've seen them uh, already yesterday. Uh, we see uh, the Landauer approach that was mentioned a lot where the conductance is proportional to the transmission and where the Seebeck coefficient is proportional to the derivative of the, the same, let's say, transmission. And that means that if you want to have a large Seebeck coefficient, <coughs> you want to have sharp features in your uh, transmission. And our approach to getting these uh, sharp features, but I will come back to that in, in the next slide, is to go close to resonance. Also, um, the the figure of merit, set D, was mentioned uh, many times. The definition is shown uh, below. It's the same definition, of course. Um, but what I wanted to uh, emphasize here is that typically, uh, for very often, people will plot the power factor, which is the conductance times the Seebeck coefficient. And if you want to do this in a proper way, it's very important that you measure these two uh, properties at the same time. And especially if you work with uh, gates, as we will do. For instance, you could, for instance, you could take a gate trace first of the conductance, and then after that, a, a gate trace of the thermal current. But then there may be a problem if there are small offset charges or other things that shift the, um, the electrochemical potentials of the molecule a little bit. And then it will be very difficult uh, to properly um, calculate this power factor. So to do that, you have to measure these two properties simultaneously if you want to assess this uh, number in, in, an, uh, in an accurate way. The other important point, of course, is here the uh, <coughs> thermal conductance and, and wiedemann franz law and all of that. I will come back to that in, in, at the end. I will already uh, tell you that we cannot measure the thermal conductance, and so we can only estimate our uh, figure of merit by assuming uh, certain properties of the thermal uh, conductance. But let's go on and first discuss this enhancement of the thermoelectric effects. If you go, let's say, to the bottom two, and maybe first to the bottom one, that's where quantum interference effects should be able to push the uh, figure of, oh, sorry, sorry, the, uh, the Seebeck coefficient up. 
You see on the left bottom, you see in green the transmission. And if there is a quantum interference feature, you see some kind of a Fano. In this case, it's some kind of a Fano uh, uh, resonance. And of course, close to this Fano resonance, the derivative of the transmission is very high. So this could be a way to increase, uh, sharply increase the C-back coefficient. People have seen a small changes or increases of the C-back coefficient by quantum interference, but these very sharp increases have not been seen yet. Another way, of course, is to reduce the tunneling coupling, and that is shown in the middle two panels. In green, you see that the Lorentzians near the, near the resonances are, are narrower, meaning that the tunnel coupling is smaller. That also means that the slope there is larger, so that would be another way of increasing the um, uh, Seebeck coefficient. But what we want to do is to use the gate to bring the resonance the, the molecular level, let's say it differently, uh, closer to the Fermi energy of the leads, and in this way, increase the c back coefficient. And how does that work? Well, let's first look at the, um, the conductance. So if we now put an electrical bias, so this is on the left-hand side is our model. We have two sources, we have a source and a drain, and in blue you see the um, occupation of the electrons up to the Fermi energy, and then in red you see the molecular discrete level. And for simplicity, we just take one simple single level. Now we put a bias on, and that means that for, in this case, there is a negative bias and the source, the <clears throat> chemical potential of the source goes up. If we, you know, by an uh, amount of EV. And now if we uh, use the gate, what we can do is we can push this level through the bias window. And you see that as soon as you push it through the bias window, this this bio win bias window of EV, and you see that there is going to be a current flowing. Um, and that means that you can see this current, you, see, you can also measure the uh, conductance. On both sides of these, this current, and you see that we have Coulomb blockade because the level is not in the bias window and cannot be used for transport. So what happens now if we do a thermal bias? So it's very important to realize that there is no electrical bias. So you see on the left-hand side now that I have heated up my left lead. It became red. You see also that the Fermi function has changed because, uh, the, because of the heating. And then on the right-hand side, we have the cold lead. And we're going to do the same thing now. So we're going to put the level down. I hope, yes, we do it. We do it. We go down, we go up slowly. And you see that you get a signal first, a positive signal, because there are electrons moving from right to left. But then in the hot part, and there are electrons moving from, from the right, uh, from the left to the right. And that is because <clears throat> in the, let's say if we go above the Fermi energy, there are states on the left-hand side, but there are no states on the right-hand side. And that means that the electrons move from left to right. Below the Fermi energy, you see that there are more states on the right-hand side than on the left-hand side. So that means that electrons move, or you can better say maybe holes, because this is, these are occupied states. Holes move from <coughs> one side, from the uh, right to the left. And this gives you this very peculiar shape of the thermal current or, or voltage. It has uh, on one side of the resonance a positive peak and a negative peak on the other side. And exactly at the Fermi energy, it will be zero. So we can now define uh, also our uh, thermal voltage and thermal current. Um, <clears throat> and they are proportional to the difference in temperature and the differences between the hot and the cold lead, TH minus TC. And then the thermal voltage is uh, the, the proportionality factor is the Z-back coefficient. There is a minus sign there for convention. And then the thermal current is the same Z-back coefficient times the conductance uh, times the difference in temperature, that will be then the thermal current. So this has been uh, <clears throat> shown before, and I show you here two examples. This is one of them, uh, where people used the gate. You can see it here. You have a hot electrode on the left-hand side with a heater. And there you did in indeed see um, 
in the, let's say, right bottom, the Seebeck coefficient as the function of the gate voltage, you do see that there is a dependence of the Seebeck coefficient, but you don't see this, let's say, peak-like up-down structure and that you expect uh, for go, uh, near the resonance for the molecule, of, of the molecule. In uh, this case, I mean, it was C60. I think it should have been there, but maybe um, <clears throat> the measurements were not uh, accurate enough to really capture that, uh, that behavior. The next uh, example is uh, done by the people in, in, in Oxford. There you already see Pascal uh, Gehring uh, being part of it. And if you look in the, in the, in the, let's say in the middle of the screen, a little bit to the bottom, you see already there this uh, VT, this is the thermal voltage as a function of gate voltage. You do see already this behavior that I just sketched, a peak, a positive peak on one side and a negative peak on another side. And if you look at the conductance at the same time, which is uh, plotted above that, <coughs> you see very nicely the Coulomb peak. And exactly at the maximum, uh, you are on resonance, and that is indeed also the, the position where the uh, thermal voltage is then zero. So this is the response of going through the resonance of, again, a molecule that looks very similar. It's, a, 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 sorry, a, it's almost a C60 uh, molecule. But <clears throat> if you look at the device geometry that's on the right-hand side, there are still a few things that are not so optimal. Now, first of all, you can see that the heater is on the right-hand side, whereas the graphene electrodes that were used in this case, and if you look at this bow tie-like structure, the junction is formed in the narrowest part, you see that the heater is pretty far away from that. <clears throat> and that means that you have a very low heating efficiency. It also means <clears throat> that if you start heating up, you heat up, of course, uh, the right-hand side, but you also heat up the left-hand side uh, appreciably. So it means that uh, the whole substrate will be heated a lot to generate only a very small uh, change in temperature between the left and the right-hand side. Another problem or another maybe point of improvement is that if you use graphene, <clears throat> and, and I don't know exactly the reason for that, but if you use graphene, typically you're in the very weak coupling limit, electronic coupling between electrodes and uh, molecule. So if you want to look at the more intermediate regime, and for instance, look at condo physics, graphene does not seem to be the right material for the electrodes. So <clears throat> we have changed the, this, uh, this, this layout. And to be honest, this is uh, to a very, very large extent, um, um, how do you say that, copied from the work that was done in Lund, where you have, let's say, a nanowire. Because what they do there is that they have the heaters um, just below, or you can also put them just on top of your electrodes. So the heaters now are shown in blue. Your electrodes are shown in, let's say, yellowish color. And you also see now that we have in purple a gate. And again, this bow tie-like uh, shape but now this is made of gold, and we're going to use electromigration to make a very small gap in that one, and then use heaters and uh, a, a more complicated way of measuring where we use uh, um, lock-in measurements. I will show you that in, in a minute, and uh, to measure simultaneously the conductance and the thermal current. So once again, the layout and the, let's say, the in summary of the, 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 the improvements. And so the, the fact that the heater and contacts are separated only by a thin oxide layer means that you have very efficient heating, that you can also have a very large delta T. So you can most likely very easily go into the nonlinear regime. And um, if you want to go really to low temperatures, so in the Dill fridge, but we have not done that yet, uh, this Sample layout would be optimal for that because you can uh, use very low uh, heating powers. We have I've already talked about the gold electrodes. Uh, gives you a little bit more freedom in choosing molecules and going to the intermediate to strong uh, coupling uh, limit. And you can also see the gate. It's really underneath the, um, the molecule in this case. So this gives you a very high, let's say relatively high uh, gate coupling. 
The fabrication is done uh, with e-beam. <coughs> it's a four-step process. You see that we have um, local uh, the, the, the gates. The, this, these are made by uh, palladium. We have these micro heaters. We then uh, put um, aluminum oxide as an insulating layer over everything. So this uh, aluminum oxide layer separates uh, the heater from the uh, electrodes, but also separates in yellow now the uh, electromigration, electromigrated gold to be electromigrated gold from the gate. And then uh, we deposit uh, <coughs> the, the, the wiring. This is a little bit in orange now that is connected to all the equipment. We have done uh, the calibration, I told you already from in the beginning. So, and this is done in two different ways with a scanning um, the thermal mapping. You see in the middle of the picture, you see that if you heat up, uh, you see very nicely that you only heat up, let's say the left-hand side of your device. The right-hand side remains very, very dark in this case, and meaning that the right-hand side only heats up maybe a little bit, but not so much. What we have also done is then with this thermal mapping, you can uh, do this for different heating powers and then measure, measure let's say, the excess uh, temperature, the, sorry, the, 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 the amount of temperature increase. So this has been done with the scanning uh, thermal mapping. You can also use the, um, the resistors, the electrodes themselves. And so this is resistance to thermometry to measure, let's say, the, the temperature increase. And if you do that, you see that the two numbers uh, are very similar. And the delta T over the D uh, over the, the, the power, these are very small or give very similar numbers. And once again, you can also see that if you uh, heat up one side, also with the resistance thermometry, because we can do that on both sides of the junction, you see that you get a very small increase only on the other side. Also, what is uh, interesting here, this is a measurement done at 50 Kelvin. <clears throat> because of the thermal mapping, we cannot go to lower, couldn't go to lower temperatures. But you can see that we can heat up the uh, left-hand side by almost 60 Kelvin. So this is a huge number in, with respect to the 50 Kelvin. And that means that the thermal, um, <clears throat> let's say, gradients can be very high, meaning that you can also uh, go into the nonlinear regime especially if you go to, let's say, much lower temperatures. If you put this in a cryostat of 2 Kelvin, as we will do, and you can use, you can easily heat up, let's say, by 10 Kelvin, the, one of the leads, and have a, a very large uh, thermal bias. So then uh, <clears throat> the last step is uh, to put in the junctions. I told you already we use electromigration for that. We, use, we do that in a special way. We have a feedback-controlled electromigration. <clears throat> we also use something that we call self-breaking. And that means that we will just break the gold. Well, we will not break the gold, that's maybe better. We will put, we will make a junction of about a few kilo ohms. <clears throat> so there's still a connection then from gold. And then we found that because of the electromigrations, you put so much strain in this very narrow bridge that it just opens up by itself. And the advantage of that is that that will be done in a more gentle way so that you don't form additional gold grain that uh, may arise or that may, uh, may, that may uh, form uh, during this, this process. We then do the molecule deposition. We then pump and cool down to uh, 1.8 Kelvin. I uh, <clears throat> just want to briefly say, because I'm maybe the first, so what do we measure? Well, if we, just, if we don't consider any thermal... Uh, uh, measurements at all. What we measure is just the conductance as a, uh, as a function or the IV characteristics as a function of source drain and gate voltage. And what you then get are these diamond-like shapes. And these diamond-like shapes tell you that in within a diamond, and that is the white region, that there is no current. And that is because there is no state, no um, state of the molecule in the bias window. And then uh, charge is blocked. This is the Coulomb blockade. But then if you move either in gate voltage or in um, bias voltage, you can go to the blue regions. And in the blue regions, you are on resonance. And then there is a, a state within the bias window and you have a high current. So this is a, a very standard way of doing basically spectroscopy or to characterize your devices. And you can get a lot of information out of these 
these plots. So this is then the, the molecule and the, some of the measurements that we have done. So the molecule is a high spin molecule in, uh, with an, uh, a special arrangement. So this is a molecule that has a spin of seven over two. And uh, what you see are three different samples. And I only zoomed in on the, on the, the what we call the degeneracy point. So that means that is the point where at zero bias you are on resonance. And you see um, <clears throat> three different samples. You see that they are a little bit asymmetrically coupled because it's not a perfect, let's say, a triangle and triangle that uh, the, the bottom and the top are the same. But you also see that there is an uh, excitation running through these diamonds. This excitation is around one to two millivolts in all three devices. So this gives us some kind of uh, confidence that, that we are really measuring the molecule and that we have some specific features of this molecule. I have to hurry up a little bit. So now we start measuring the thermal currents at the same time. So what we do is we have this special uh, lock-in technique and you see here the, uh, on the, the right-hand side, the, 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 the sequence that we use. So we have the gate voltage, of course, and we measure at a certain gate voltage. And at that, measure, at that gate voltage, we measure then the conductance, that is the middle panel. And we measure that, uh, so we have then, an, we put a particular voltage across the uh, device. And then at the end of this, this, this block, and we measure the current going through. And with that, we have the IV. And with that, we can measure then also the differential conductance and, and all of that. Then in a second step, uh, we heat up the sample also with a block wave, but this is then um, uh, done after measuring the, the voltage. And then we do the same. We measure the thermal current at the end of this block wave, and then this will be repeated. And if you look at uh, the bottom row, you see the differential conductance, the thermal current, and the power factor measured on this molecule. These are then measured, in this case, at zero uh, bias. And this was uh, the way we measure this and how we optimized uh, the measurement setups. Um, you can see that um, in this paper that was published uh, a year ago. I want to emphasize one thing, though, is that you see the thermal current in the middle. You also see that these currents are small. They are smaller than a picoamp. And this means that the use of the lock-in techniques is, is very important uh, because otherwise you cannot pick up uh, these signals. So let's now move on and what we now do is we go away from zero uh, bias, but we measure also the thermal currents at, um, at finite bias. And here you see the, the three different measurements that we do at the same time. We measure the electrical current on the left top. Then at the same time, we can measure or calculate the differential conductance. <clears throat> and then on the bottom, you see the thermal current uh, measured at the same time. And if you go, let's go through the zero bias, uh, you see already that on the left-hand side it's red and on the right-hand side it's blue. So this typical behavior where you have a peak on one side and a dip on the other side, and you already see that here. But you also see that that, that typical structure that is present at every edge of the Coulomb diamond. So is there anything else that we can learn from these, uh, these uh, uh, plots. Well, we then have to go to the theoretical models and the comparison to the theoretical models. And we have used the three different models. So the Landauer picture that I just presented in the beginning. Then we have a model where we have, uh, where we use the rate equations, which is a very common thing to do in single electron tunneling devices. But there we did not take into account uh, the vibrational modes. And then we have a third model where we included the uh, vibrational mode. And I will come back, I will give you the reference to the paper where you can find the uh, details of that calculation. But for now I want to emphasize that if you just take Landauer, which is the orange curve, you see very well that you cannot reproduce the IV, which is plot A on the left hand side. And if you, uh, and you can also, if you then take, well, if you take the best fit, and that best fit will be the low bias behavior. Then if you take these numbers, you can not um, 
at all uh, fit the uh, conductance peak, which is in B. And also the uh, thermal current, although you may say, okay, it qualitatively captures the right behavior. If you look into details, you see that it cannot, um, re uh, it cannot capture all the, the, the features of the, of the measurement. The rate equations that is in green, they do a little bit of a better job. You can already see that, but still they are not, uh, not very accurate. And what we found is that if you really want to um, <coughs> accurately describe both the current as a function of source strain, so what we did is we fitted um, the, we used for instance a single mode and we fit the energy of that mode in, in the, and, and the coupling, the, the electron phonon coupling, to get the blue curve in the left hand side. And with these parameters, we then calculated the uh, Coulomb peak and the thermal current, and you see, and then so there are no additional fit parameters. You see that we very get a very very good uh, correspondence between the theory and the um, measurements. I told you that I will show you the the, the 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 work. You can find the details of how this is done here again. This uh, Oxford group, um, and what they used is this generalized quantum master equation, where you can include uh, vibrational modes. So if you then do that for, I mean, also yeah, you can also calculate then a, 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 a Coulomb diamond uh, for the conductance and the thermal current, and then compare them to the fear of through the measured ones, and that is what we have done here. <coughs> you see that the correspondence is, is pretty good. And you can get the same uh, shapes. You can also see that in the experiment we have an, uh, an, uh, an excitation. This is this excitation at two milliarton volts. You also see that in the calculated one. And what is very important is that if you play a little bit with the numbers, that this, <coughs> and that was especially in the previous one where we looked at the zero bias one, the fit parameter is then the delta T, the difference in temperature between the two leads. And that difference in temperature was for this particular experiment 0.8. So this is the fit parameter when comparing data with the, the let's say, the data measured with the um, calculated data. So interesting here is already that you see that also the thermal current uh, shows the, the presence of an excited state and can be uh, seen in the thermal current. So then if you have the delta t, you can now uh, also calculate the z back coefficient, so that is now done in d, and also the power factor, and what you see here, the behavior that you would expect, let's say globally, but you also see that the, power, the, the z back coefficient is very high. And we find values up to 400 microvolts per Kelvin. I think that the highest that we have is, is maybe five or even 600 microvolts per Kelvin in a, a different sample. So very high numbers. But this is the whole story. No, it's not the whole story. Because if you look very carefully at the thermal current and you look at this peak dip structure, you see it's asymmetric. And that is shown on the left-hand side in, in the, the, the measurements and the blue curve. So it's already in the theoretical description. And I've, on purpose, of course, uh, didn't tell you why uh, why that asymmetry uh, arises, because then I can put a little bit more emphasis on it. But you see very clearly that if you just take the dashed lines, that if you go to the, let's say, the positive point, you can go to 0 0.09 picoamps, whereas in the uh, negative part, you go beyond the 0 0.1 uh, picoamps. So there's a clear asymmetry. We measure that as a function of delta t, so that is shown on the right-hand side. It's very consistent. You see that for a small delta t, where there are large, I mean, then the, 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 the signals are very small, we have large error bars. But as soon as we increase the delta t a little bit, and you see very consistently that we have a ratio of about 1.3 in, in this case. So where does this asymmetry come from? Well, it comes from the degeneracy of the charge uh, ground states. And uh, just before saying a little bit more about it, I also show you here the, the second device. You also see this asymmetry. And you also see very nicely on the right-hand side that we can capture this asymmetry very well with the model. 
Again, the delta t is the, um, uh, the fit parameter together with, of course, the gammas, the electronic couplings. Uh, but those are also used for the, to reproduce the conductance, of course. But, our, but to get this asymmetry, we have to take the degener degeneracy of the ground states into account. Meaning that the n is the doublet, that's what we find in both samples, and the n plus one is a singlet. And it's this, let's say, asymmetry, and that gives rise to the asymmetry in the response, the thermal response. An important other point here to make is that the left, and that is also what we find consistently, left and right couplings, electronic couplings, are very asymmetric. And so one coupling is always, for the samples that we studied, uh, much larger than the other one. Okay, so can we then prove that this is really due to the degeneracy? Yes, you can do that by measuring the uh, Coulomb peak as a function of temperature. Then you plot the maximum in energy, so that is the gate voltage, and you use then the, the gate coupling to convert that into an energy. You plot that as a function of temperature, you expect to see a, right, a straight line. And uh, for the en entropy change that we um, had in our thermal current, that is the drawn line, and you see that we get a very, very good fit uh, through the data, meaning uh, that both ways of determining the entropy of the system is uh, the same. But of course, the advantage of using the thermal current is that you just used one measurement at a particular uh, temperature. Here you have to use uh, many different measurements at different temperatures and to, to find the slope of this delta mu uh, versus T and to find then the change in entropy. Okay, I'm, I think I'm almost done. I will try to wrap up a little bit quickly now, because you could say, oh, wow, um, that is nice, this entropy, but uh, you told me that this uh, molecule is a high spin molecule, seven over two. And if I have a molecule with seven over two, I don't expect the entropy change to be the one corresponding from going to, from a doublet to a singlet. You expect a larger change. And we don't see that. So what is going on? Well, a possible scenario is that, and that has been seen in the literature also, for instance, for molecules with a d orbital, and you see here the manganese on the right-hand side molecule, is that you don't charge the ion in the middle because there these states are very much lower in energy compared to the Fermi energy or higher, but you charge the ligand, one of the ligand positions. And the asymmetry in the electronic coupling most likely plays a very important role because these ligand uh, positions, if you put a charge there, are then stabilized by image charges. Meaning that if you have a very asymmetric molecule of a, a coupling, that one part of the molecule is very close to the gold. And let's say differently, one, let's say part of the ligand structure is very close to the gold. Putting an electron there will not cost a lot of energy, it will cost much less energy than putting it on the ion in the middle of the molecule. And in this way, uh, you basically have a transition between a singlet and a triplet. If that uh, electron is not very strongly exchange coupled uh, to the ion, the magnetic, field, uh, the magnetic ion in the middle. And most likely that coupling is not so strong because of all the gold uh, that is uh, image charge stabilizing the position of this electron. So that is then a possible scenario to explain why these single, singlet to doublet uh, ground states are there. It would of course be very interesting to use the thermal current to, to show uh, that you can have uh, charging of this ion in the middle and that you can then uh, access many different states and see uh, how the thermal current would, would change in that, set, in that case. I want to finish with the zero ZT estimates. I told you before, we, have, we don't know the thermal conductance, but since we are at very low temperatures to Kelvin, uh, we can at first, uh, in the first approximation, neglect the phonons. And then uh, the equation becomes the one that I show you here on the slide. And then we have to estimate this, um, this uh, thermal conductance. Well, we can use wiedemann franz law um, that is very straightforward, uh, and that is also shown in the right-hand side. Oh, sorry, in the plot on the, on the bottom, we have ZT as a function of gate voltage, so we go through the resonance here, 
And you see that the ZT is then uh, maximum about two. We have found a little bit higher numbers in, in other samples. So this is a very large, large number. But there have been also uh, uh, reports in the literature that uh, the Wiedemann-Franz law may not hold or that there may be some deviations from it. So we also used uh, two other models to uh, estimate this uh, thermal conductance. One of them is this uh, one by S. Posito, where you just say that the um, thermal conductance is the molecular orbital energy difference with respect to the Fermi energy times the thermal currents. And we have also used the rate equation model uh, approach to calculate the heat uh, current and then uh, relate that uh, uh, heat current to the thermal conductance by the, the temperature difference that we put in the calculations. And then if you see the green and blue curves, they indeed are a little bit smaller than the Wiedemann-Franz law, the estimates uh, from that, by about a factor of two or something like that, but that's not very, I mean, dramatic. And if you take this all together, uh, we would say that an estimate, a safe estimate for our ZT value would be around one in these devices. So, Considering the time, I will uh, wrap up now. Conclusions and outlook. Uh, we can measure thermal current Coulomb diamonds. It's interesting that the thermal currents give access to the entropy changes and vibrational modes. So we have to keep in mind that it's not just the derivative of the conductance. There may be other information in there. And this is basically the, the things that we're doing now. We are trying to see whether we can use the thermal current as a new spectroscopic tool, for instance, in condo physics. And that is shown on the left-hand side already, where you see the condo peak as a function of magnetic field, and you see nothing in the conductance, but you start to see things already in the, in the thermal current. So again, um, there may be additional information uh, hidden there. Also on the right-hand side, we see something we completely don't understand. Uh, just by putting in the magnetic field, we see that we can get a change in the sign of the thermal current, which we don't understand, but which may have to do with some kind of non-equilibrium effects or uh, levels that move into resonance or out of resonance. Uh, at the moment, we don't know, but this is the, the future directions where, what, that we want to go into and where we want to understand better how we can use the thermal current as a new spectroscopic tool. And with that, I thank you for your attention and take questions. Thank you very much for the interesting uh, talk. So um, if you have questions, then uh, please write them in the, uh, in the chat or raise your hand now and please write out your uh, name if you ask a question by chat. <clears throat> There is nothing in well uh, Alian Pauli has two questions but he didn't write them. Yeah. Can I ask can I ask? Please, um, please. Okay, so um just first to understand the theory uh, model. So um I mean do you have two free parameters? Did I understand that correctly? So something like the vibrational mode energy and the electron phonon coupling for the rate equation approach? Yeah. Okay. And and something, I mean, which I find very impressive is your, your high um, ZT. But uh, let's say in the beginning, you, you showed somehow that you have um, some coupling of your heating between the left and the right. And I didn't fully understand why, why you have it there and later not. And do you think that radiative effects um, may also be present? Yes. Well, there the are two questions eh, there. So the first one is that, we say that uh, indeed we heat up, but you can see, let me, uh, why isn't it going? Yeah, there it is. If you look at the fit parameters here, you do see that we also in our fit take into account that the uh, cold side heat ups a little bit. And if you look at the, and that is then really, uh, so if you look at these, let's say the thermal current on the right hand side, this plot C, if you would not heat up, the, the cold side, you will only see one line here. You would not see the other uh, Coulomb edge. So from that measurement, from that, that observation already tells you that you have a little bit of heating of the cold side as well, because otherwise you cannot explain that. Uh -huh. we, so it's part of the, the whole way of looking at, at our data and also in the, the, the comparison with the theory that we have to, that we do take that into account because otherwise we cannot 
uh, reproduce our data. The second part is there's this radiative um, uh, contribution. To be very honest, we have not looked at that at all. So we should maybe uh, put in some, um, yeah, some estimates whether that could play a role or, or not. And I, how, oh, how did you... I have no feeling for it, to be honest. I see. And how did you... Um, you said something in the beginning, you had a worse um, system design with a heater on the right, and mm -hmm. later on it got improved. Um, so how do you... Um, in which sense do you improve that um, you heat the... What was the left side less or something? Yes, I mean, the cold side remains uh, very much colder than... Uh, in the other designs. So basically what you're doing then is you globally heat the whole sample and of course there's a little bit of a temperature difference because the heater is far away but you basically put the whole um, uh, let's say device to a, a high temperature. If we can heat up much more locally one part of the device so we still heat up a little bit to the left hand side but not as much so the average temperature is much lower and that means that you can not only, uh, so that the average time is not, it's not only much lower, but you can also put a larger gradient across. And that was because uh, of substrate heating or why did you have such a strong coupling between the, uh, or heating between left and right then? Because they have, the heater is far away from your device, relatively speaking. So you start heating up the whole substrate. You have to do that. And we have uh, our heater just really on, on top or just below in our case, our electrode. So we directly heat up the electrode. Okay. That's the big difference. So I, I think we are already running a bit over time. Does, is there some uh, other short question left? This has a question, so you can do it very yeah, fast. I just, yeah. I, I hear it, nice talk. Could you just quickly reiterate the reason and you chose the gadolinium complex, please. I mean, th th there are different reasons. Uh, to, be, to be very honest, we just had the molecule in, in, in hand. But of course, when we started to understand that it's also the, the spin entropy and these kind of things, the high spin would be an interesting, let's say, additional feature and that you don't have, for instance, in a, in a quantum dot, in an inorganic quantum dot or something like that. But uh, we have not found uh, evidence that we can directly charge the, uh, the gadolinium uh, ion itself. Okay. Thank okay, you. So then uh, I think uh, um, we should then move to the next speaker. Thank you very much uh, for the very interesting and inspiring talk. And then uh, I would like to ask uh, Geneviève to sh share her screen. Okay. <clears throat> Yes, good morning. Okay, so the next speaker uh, is now Geneviève uh, Fleury uh, from uh, CEA uh, Saclay. Uh, please, Geneviève, can you, you can share your screen. Okay, can you see the presentation? Yes. Okay, so good morning, uh, everybody. I'm Geneviève Fleury from Paris Saclay University. And first of all, I would like to thank the organizers for the invitation and for holding this colloquium in spite of the situation. So thanks a lot for your work. Now I'm going to uh, present you a numerical software we have developed in Saclay to investigate time-dependent thermoelectric transport uh, in uh, quantum systems. This work has been done in collaboration with Adel Karas-Liman, who is a PhD student, and with Philippe Reck, who was a postdoc in the group uh, last year. And also, I would like to acknowledge the support of uh, Christophe Groot, Thomas Kloss, Xavier Vantal, and Joseph Weston, who are the main developers of TQUANT. TQUANT being a software for time-dependent quantum transport, on top of which we have built an extension to study time-dependent thermoelectric transport. So even if they are not directly involved in this project, they, they gave us access to TQUANT and they helped us for uh, the implementation of the new extension. Uh, okay, so I will start my presentation by discussing the main motivations of the, of the project. Why are we interested in the time-dependent regime? 
Then I will give a short introduction to the quant software and its time-dependent extension, tquant. And finally, I will explain how we have extended tquant for time-dependent thermoelectric transport. And I will show you two examples of uh, applications. So let's start with the uh, motivations. From a theoretical point of view, it's uh, instructive to consider this uh, resonant level time model. So it's made of a single uh, contact dot connected to two uh, electronic reservoirs at different temperatures and different electrochemical potentials. And the energy level in the dot can be shifted up and down in time with, let's say, a top gate. And in this uh, first paper by Adeline Crepieu and uh, collaborators, they have calculated the thermal power of the device in a Seebeck configuration uh, when the energy level in the dot is suddenly varied in time like that with, um, with the step function. And they found that the thermal power can be enhanced in the transient regime uh, with respect to the, to the static case. And the same observation has also been made uh, more recently in this paper for the thermoelectric efficiency of this uh, heat engine. So it looks promising. It seems there is a room, there is hope for enhanced uh, thermoelectric devices in uh, in the dynamical regime. However, we don't really understand the origin of those results. Even the meaning of the time resolves quantities is not fully clear from a thermodynamic point of view. And of course, those results have to be confirmed for uh, more complicated setups. From a technical point of view, the results I've just shown uh, before have been obtained uh, analytically by using the non-equilibrium Green's function approach. And it can be done for this simple uh, time model, but in general, it's extremely difficult even numerically to integrate the equations of the non-equilibrium Green's function formalism. That's why other alternative techniques have been uh, used in the literature. I, this is a, a non-exhaustive list uh, and I won't enter into details, but I want to comment on uh, two points. So first, in practice, uh, those techniques have been applied mostly for small systems like this resonant level model or a few dots uh, model studied in this, uh, in this paper or a benzene molecule uh, taken from this paper, but not for large systems. And second, each technique suffers, of course, from limitations. So for instance, the wide band limit or uh, the assumption of weak coupling between the, the quantum system and the bus or the assumption of slow driving so that calculations can be made perturbatively near the adiabatic limit. And that's the reason why we believe uh, there is a need in the community for a new numerical tool as generic as possible that can deal with large realistic quantum devices with arbitrary time-dependent perturbations, in particular in the non-adiabatic uh, regime. So before uh, going further, I would like to say now a few words about experimental motivations. So on one hand, in the DC regime, we know there are several uh, experiments we, which uh, have shown that it's possible to manipulate heat uh, in uh, nano devices for thermoelectric applications. So we have seen some examples during this colloquium. Here I show you this, uh, for instance, this setup studied in the group of Heiner Linke. It can be seen as an experimental implementation of the resonant level model I've uh, introduced before, but without uh, time-dependent perturbations. So here the, the dot is here uh, in, the, in the green nanowire. And they have shown that this uh, quantum dot can operate as a heat engine near Carnot efficiency and with finite output power. 
On the other end, there have been also much uh, technical progress in the last decade in the field of high frequency nanoelectronics. And for instance, one important milestone is the realization of single electron sources in various platforms. So let me mention, for instance, uh, the Leviton source, which was implemented in, in Saclay in the group of Christian Glatley, by applying some Laurentian voltage pulses on a, on a contact, which are uh, very well resolved in time. So th they are typically a few picoseconds wide uh, at 20 millikelvin. Now the idea would be to combine those two sets of experiments in order to study thermoelectric effects in the, uh, dy in the dynamical regime. And a related uh, breakthrough has been achieved recently in the group of uh, Yuka Pecola. They have been able to implement a time-resolved thermometer in superconducting circuits. So I take the, the occasion to, to advertise the talk of Bayan Karimi tomorrow. She will probably uh, discuss this uh, experiment. So uh, now, um, if you remember, I told you that our uh, numerical package has been uh, built as an extension of the TQUANT software, which is itself an extension of the QUANT software. So now I will give you a short introduction to, to QUANT and TQUANT in the context of a charge transport. So let's start with TQUANT, uh, with QUANT which uh, describes electronic quantum transport without time-dependent perturbations. It has been developed in uh, Grenoble and Delft in the groups of Xavier Vintal, Anton Akmerov, and Michael Wimmer. The code is open source, so you, you can download it uh, here at this address. And so the goal in, with quant is to um, simulate electronic quantum transport in any geoscopic devices which can be described by a non-interacting pipe binding model. And um, so the input Hamiltonian is, is uh, quadratic, but otherwise fully arbitrary. We can consider arbitrary, we can consider different lattices, we can consider uh, different shapes of the scattering region. We can also add uh, several uh, terminals. We can add disorder or spin orbit coupling or whatever, as long as the system can be described by a non-interacting time binding model. Then quant calculates um, the scattering states in the leads and in the scattering region at a, at a given energy E. And by matching the boundary conditions, we can deduce the scattering matrix. So in particular, we can calculate the transmission and reflection probabilities from one lead to another. And since we have the scattering states, we can also calculate the local density and the local current in the, in the scattering region. And we also have access to the band structure in the lead. So you see that with quant, we can deal with a large amount of problems. So now I would like only to show you a few recent examples in the last uh, two years. So for instance, uh, quant has been used to simulate electronic uh, quantum transport in topological superconductors to discuss the signatures of Majorana fermions. It has also been much, much uh, used to simulate um, quantum transport in graphene here with, um, with a magnetic field which deviates the electronic path and with disorder. Here, this is an example of application in the field of spin orbitronics with fermions. And uh, also quant has been used to simulate thermoelectric transport. So I think that during this colloquium, uh, a poster will be presented by uh, Alun Aydin about such applications. So if you are interested, uh, you, you are invited to, to have a look for more details. So that's only a few random examples among a lot of possible applications, just to illustrate the fact that quant has become a powerful and, and popular uh, software for simulating electronic quantum transport. 
because of its versatility, because of its efficiency, and also because its interface is easy to use. So it's quite easy to, to learn quant. So now let's continue with CQuant, which is a time-dependent extension of quant. It has been developed in Grenoble and uh, it's available here. So in, in T-Quant, uh, the input Hamiltonian is uh, still a non-interacting type body model, but now it can be made time-dependent. And the time-dependent parameters are uh, fully arbitrary. So for instance, they can account for a local top gate, which induces underneath some time-dependent on-site potential. They can account for a time-dependent magnetic field, or we can also apply um, time-dependent voltage uh, pulse in, a, in one lead. And in that, in that case, it's, uh, it's important to, to have in mind that local gauge transformation can be made so that in the end, the, the time-dependent voltage in the lead is absorbed in the couplings between the lead and the scattering region through this extra phase why the, the, the lead itself becomes time independent. And that's very important from a numerical point of view because it, it allows us to, to confine the, the time dependent perturbations in the central system, uh, which is finite, which can be described by a finite matrix. And there is also a second important comment in TQuant the chemical potential and the temperature of each electronic reservoir attached to the leads are given as input parameters of the simulation. So they characterize the thermodynamic equilibrium of each electronic reservoir, where dissipation will take place. So this is how dissipation is included in uh, TQuant. So now let me sketch the main steps of the algorithm. It's quite simple. So we start with the stationary problem for the total system, including the, the, the leads. And we calculate with quant the stationary scattering states. So here this object is a stationary scattering state corresponding to an incoming mode alpha at the energy E. And then, we switch on time-dependent uh, perturbations, let's say at time t equals zero, and we make the scattering states uh, evolve in time according to the Schrodinger equation with this initial condition. So, of course, the tricky part is hidden here, and I won't enter into details, but conceptually it's very simple. We, we calculate the time-dependent scattering states by solving a differential equation with a standard uh, Runge-Kutta solver. And then once we have them, once we have the scattering, time dependent scattering states, we can uh, calculate, for instance, the particle current between two sides with this formula. So here you see that the different contributions are, um, are summed over the, over the modes alpha and um, integrated over the energy with a Fermi function here which guarantees that the Pauli uh, principle is always satisfied. So we can deduce the, the, the local particle current. So now let's see how T-Quant compares with other um, time-dependent uh, techniques. So we have seen that T-Quant is a wave function approach. Actually, it's fully equivalent from a mathematical point of view to the non-equilibrium Green's function approach. And there is a direct uh, link between the retarded and lesser uh, Green's function and the time-dependent scattering states calculated uh, with T-Quant. And actually, the very first version of, of T-Quant was implemented with Green's function, but it turned out to be completely inefficient. And you can see it here, for instance. So for for a 3G system of size n cubed, the computation time with green function scales as t squared times L to the power 7, while it scales as t times L cubed with a new t-quant, with, with a wave function approach. So it, it's much faster. It's also 
uh, less uh, greedy in memory, it's more stable, and it can be easily parallelized. That's why in the end, with the new sequence, we can deal with uh, large systems with almost uh, millions of sites. And uh, so we can simulate realistic devices, which are used in experiments. To continue with the comparison to the literature, let me add that uh, T-Quant is also equivalent to the Flocker scattering theory if we consider perturbations which are um, periodic in time. And also it's equivalent to the so-called partition-free approach because we start with the, with the total system, including the scattering region and the leads. So the leads are included uh, from the beginning. Uh, here, I wanted to show you a few examples of applications of T-Quant in the context of charge transport, but I'm, I'm a bit late, so I won't be long. I just, uh, just a few words about this, um, about this uh, example. So in, in Grenoble, they have been able to simulate time-dependent uh, particle transport in a Max Zender interferometer made of thousands of sites. And they have investigated how the interference pattern of this interferometer is modified when we um, apply some time-dependent voltage pulses on a source. So I, I don't want to say more. I just want to, to show you that it's, pos it's possible with T-Quant to simulate uh, time-dependent transport in a large uh, system, not only in toy models. So now it's, it's time to, to, for me to start the last part of the talk. So I will explain how we have extended T-Quant for time-dependent thermoelectric transport. So before discussing the uh, implementation, I think it's worth taking time to, to introduce first uh, the general theoretical framework. So we start with this one body Hamiltonian, which is written in a continuous space for simplicity. And we assume that we can neglect uh, the spin degree of freedom. And we assume that the time dependent perturbations are due to an external time dependent electromagnetic field. And the first question we want to answer is, what is a good uh, energy operator? So we, we know that the expectation value of the energy operator has to remain invariant under uh, gauge transformation of the time-dependent electromagnetic field. So let's do that, let's do this gauge transformation. You, you probably remember, it's just a reminder that if we do a gauge transformation, it induces a unitary transformation u on the wave function, while the Hamiltonian is modified that, that way. And the Schrodinger equation is uh, kept invariant under the gauge transformation. But the expectation value of the Hamiltonian is not gauge invariant. And you can see it here. So uh, if, we, if we sandwich uh, H tilde with psi tilde, the first contribution gives us this term. But there is another contribution due to this term, which is equal to V tilde minus V. So if we want to get rid of this contribution, we need to define the energy operator epsilon as H minus EV, when V is the time-dependent um, scalar potential. So in the static case, V is zero, and epsilon coincides with the Hamiltonian operator. But in general, in the time-dependent case, we need to define a new epsilon, a new energy operator that way, so that the expectation value is uh, gauge invariant. So now let's derive um, the, the equations of motion. So I, I come back to the, to the type binding model and I introduce the local energy operators epsilon i on site i uh, given by this definition. So they, they are almost equal to the local Hamiltonian operators, except that uh, the, the on-site terms 
is renormalized uh, that way because we have removed EV from uh, the Hamiltonian. And so let's uh, derive the equations of motion for the energy density and also for the particle density as a comparison. So for the particle density, we find this uh, standard continuity equation um, which tells us that the number of particles is conserved. So the variations of the number of particles in a small volume around the site I is given by the, by the sum of uh, currents flowing out this volume. For the energy density, we find a similar continuity equation, but now with an additional source term, which comes from the electric power density supplied by the external time-dependent electromagnetic field. So in, in the continuous space, it coincides with the standard term G dot E, where E is the time-dependent electric field and J is the time-dependent um, particle uh, current density. And uh, yes, two uh, important comments. So all those quantities, uh, the density, the currents, and the source term, they are a gauge invariant by construction. And also, they are written as a function of the lesser screen function by, by definition. So everything is encoded in the lesser Green's function. Now we need to define uh, the time-dependent uh, heat current. So there have been some debates in the literature, and there are still some debates about the proper definition of a time-resolved heat current. Here, the, the definition that comes out naturally in our model is this one, where the energy current in the lead is obtained by summing the, the local currents, the local energy currents at the interface between the lead and the scattering region. Also, the source term is obtained by summing the contribution, the local source terms in the lead, and we remove this uh, standard chemical contribution. And we have two hints which tell us this definition is not uh, so bad. So first, if um, if now the, the time-dependent perturbations converge to a static limit at long times, we have checked analytically that we recover the landauer butiker formula. As it has to be, of course, but it's better to, to check it. And uh, also, if we work in a gauge in which the leads are time-independent, and this is what, what we do, for instance, in TQUANT, so if we work in this gauge, then we, we can show that our time-dependent heat current coincides with this definition, which was put forward in those two papers and which was shown to be consistent with the second law of thermodynamics. OK, so we have um, introduced all the quantities as a function of the lesser Green's function. Now let's see how they are implemented in TQUANT, which is formulated in the wave function uh, formalism. Fortunately, we have this formula I've already shown before, which that, that relates the lesser Green's function to the time-dependent scattering states calculated in TQUANT. And so if we apply this formula for the local particle current, we get this formula uh, I've already shown before. And if we do the same job for the local energy current, we get a similar formula, but it's a bit more complicated because in addition to the sum over the modes and the integral over the energy, we have this additional sum over the neighboring side k of i and j. And we can proceed the same way to calculate the source term, uh, the time-dependent heat current, and the thermoelectric efficiencies, and, and so on. So all those formula have been uh, implemented in our small TQUANT operator extension. The code is uh, open source, so you can download it here. And we have put effort, uh, especially Adele, so the, the PhD student has put effort in writing a complete documentation with a tutorial example. So in principle, it should be uh, 
accessible, we, we, try, to, we try to make it user friendly. So the first system we have studied uh, with our new uh, package is the resonant level model I've introduced at the beginning. Because it can be solved analytically in some limits, so it gives us a good time model to, to check there is no mistake in the code. So since in, in, in TQuant we work with uh, pipeline models, we introduce this simple model made of a single central site playing the role of the dot, connected to two semi-infinite uh, one digits with hopping terms gamma c, which can be taken different from the hopping term gamma in the leaves. And so the goal is to calculate with TQuant the time-dependent heat current uh, when the, the energy level in the dot is varied uh, in time. So here you see the expected result for the time-dependent heat current in the left lead when uh, V of t is a nidicide uh, step function. So these results have been applied, have been, um, sorry, have been um, calculated with a Keldish technique, with a non-equilibrium Green's function technique, assuming the white band limit. So assuming we can neglect the energy dependency of the coupling energy, gamma. But in, in TQuant, we solve the full problem. So we, we take into account this energy dependency. And so to compare with analytics, we need to use this scaling approach, which was used previously in this paper, and which consists of uh, increasing the the width of the convection band in the leads by keeping gamma fixed and by increasing simultaneously gamma and gamma c, the hoping terms. And so if we do that, if we increase uh, the, the width of the convection band in the limit of large uh, bands, we recover the analytical result in the wide band limit. So we were happy. Uh, it was a good check to do. And uh, then, uh, yeah, yeah. So first, I would like to show you here um, uh, the full Python script, which has been used to simulate uh, the previous curves. So it's, uh, it's quite uh, simple, actually. So here you see the, the first part consists of building the system, mainly with, uh, with quant. Then we have a few uh, lines to define the Fermi functions in the reservoirs and to declare, define the, the operator. So here we tell tquant, I want to calculate, for instance, the heat current in the left lead. And then we have the tquant loop over time. So we calculate the, the scattering states and uh, the, the heat current for each uh, time step. And, and that's all. Then tquant will do the job and we will get the results for this model in a few minutes to one hour using a, only a single processor um, with a standard uh, PC. So of course, if we want to simulate uh, another system, we need to, to, to modify this part. And it can be made much uh, longer if we have a complicated system. But this part will be more or less, uh, so the sequent part will be more or less uh, unchanged. So there are a lot of options I, I have no time to, to discuss. But uh, the main message um, I want to convey is that you can start playing uh, tquant quite easily. There is no need to invest a huge amount of time to get your first results. And so uh, now um, I, will, I will end my talk by showing you this, uh, this example of application in a larger system in a quantum point contact. So here you see, you see the, the confining potential in a nano ribbon connected to two uh, leads. And uh, here uh, you, you, you see the transmission function calculated with quant, which shows some uh, quantized steps uh, as expected. And so now we ask ourselves, 
whether or not it's possible to enhance spatial cooling of the left reservoir by applying some, deep, some time dependent voltage pulses in the left lead. So if, if the left reservoir is colder than the right one, is it possible nevertheless to extract heat from the left reservoir? We know it's uh, possible in the DC regime if we work, for instance, around the first uh, transmission step, but can we make it better in the dynamical regime? So to investigate this uh, question, we have uh, calculated with sequent the time-dependent heat current in the left lead in red, and also the, the particle current in blue. And we have reproduced the calculation for different voltage pulses with uh, increasing width. So in the, in, the, in the adiabatic limit, so in the limit of long pulses, it is possible, we see that it is possible to extract heat from the left reservoir because okay, the heat current is positive. And this is because we are here, we are around the first uh, transmission step. So no surprises. But on the contrary, if, if we are in the non-adiabatic regime, so in the limit of short pulses now, then we find that the heat current in the left is, is, is almost uh, rather negative. So it lets us believe that the, the dynamical regime is rather bad for petty cooling, but that's only first result. So it's likely uh, the story doesn't stop here. At least it, it shows that it's now possible to, we still want to, to investigate uh, these kinds of problems. Now, uh, it's time to conclude. So we have developed uh, an extension to the TQUANT software, which allows us to simulate time dependent thermoelectric transport in uh, large uh, devices with arbitrary time dependent perturbations, in particular in the non adiabatic regime. But there are still uh, some uh, issues which need to be clarified and much work to do. In particular, we would like to include electron electron interactions at the mean field level with a, with a time dependent heart resolver. And uh, finally, if you are interested in TQUANT and in uh, our uh, extension, you are invited to have a look at uh, this website. We welcome very much your, your, uh, your questions and, uh, and your feedback. And I stop here. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much for the interesting talk, uh, for introducing this interesting tool to us and first nice results. Um, there is now time for questions. Hi, I'm Pauli, I have one in the chat. Okay, um, I would have a question. Um, you said in your talk that um, at some you, the implementation was somehow using at some point Green's functions and you found that to be completely inefficient. Now, I would say that Green's function or such a, you know, um, scattering formalism where you work with states should be completely equivalent. And there are, of course, uh, clever ways to use Green's functions, especially if you have just nearest neighbor couplings, you know, you can do some um, iterative inversion of your um, of the Hamiltonian in your scattering region to get the, the Green's function more or less. So, so um, can you maybe explain me why you think that your CPU time is so much better than using Green's functions at the moment and, and why you could not repeat that same with, with the Green's function formalism actually where you use clever algorithms? Um, so of course I agree that it's completely equivalent to the non-equilibrium Green's function. So probably there is a way also to to, to implement everything with Green's function with the same uh, computation time. But if you do it, the problem was if we, if we write the equations for uh, with Green's function, the first equation we get is an integral, dif integral differential equation. So the, there is a differential part and an integral, and that's really hard to solve. So that, this disappears if we work with Green's, with the scattering state. And I, I, I don't know, it's, I agree that since it's, Equivalent mathematically, mathematically, probably 
also we can make it uh, faster with Flink function. But it was somehow simpler to, to, to work with Catherine Flink. Okay, thanks. Well, we have another question from Joren Serra. And he asked, do you need to include large portions of the leads in the simulation grid? To include? Sorry. Large portions of the leads in the simulation grid. Um, okay, I'm not sure I understand the question. <laughs> Maybe it's better if I if I can uh, see it in the chat. Um, so yeah. to include in the leads, do you need yeah. to include large portions? Do you, so do you how how big is the is the are the leads? How big are the leads? Yeah. Um, the, we we can play with one delete, two deletes, or three deletes. Uh, of course, the computation time will be longer for three deletes. So, uh, yes, in, in, we can do we, we can play with uh, with any shape in, in the leads. But then, if we want to recover this wide band limit, uh, even with one delete, we can do that by playing with the. Uh, okay, this it was the. the it was a scaling approach I showed here, but I'm not sure I'm answering the question. Uh, here, even with one delete, uh, we can reach the wideband limit by using the scaling approach. We, so if we increase uh, the hoping term gamma, we increase uh, the width of the conviction band, and so we can reach the, the wideband limit that way. But probably I've not understood the question. Okay. There's perhaps time for one uh, last question now. There is one more in the chat. Okay, can, um, can we have this one? So Clemens Winkelmann asks uh, ask a, a naive question, as he says. Uh, can you explain the time-dependent heat current, so the, the analytic result by Krepier with Hans? Uh, so which one? Uh, this result that was on the screen. Yeah, one for the for the Rosman level, I guess. Yes, here. Yes. Oh, okay. This one. So you, the mat is okay. If we can calculate the self energy of the one D lead, so there is a mathematical formula for for that. And now, if we take this limit, uh, we can show that the real part of the of the self energy is uh, tends to zero. Why the, the imaginary part, which is uh, proportional to gamma, uh, becomes time becomes uh, energy independent. So that's why, okay, in the end, if we take uh, large lambda, so it makes means if we take large hoping terms, uh, the real part of the self energy is zero, while gamma becomes energy independent, and this is exactly the the white band limit. So uh, I'm an experimenter, so I was just wondering why in the beginning heat is going negative and then positive again and then negative again. Ah, okay. Uh, no, I don't know. Okay. I, don't, I have no intuition. Yeah, I think before moving on, we have uh, one uh, short uh, comment. Okay, do you want to uh, unmute yourself? Yeah, so can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, so my name is Jaime Ferrer and I would like to make a comment that agrees with Fabian's uh, uh, affirmation. So the point is that at least with Golun and I think that with TB trans and many other codes, you can easily go to 10 to the 6 and 10 to the 7 atoms. So it's a question of how clever you make the algorithms. Uh, and these are things functions based. Um, I believe that the main uh, bottleneck could be if you use Keldich to do self consistent to get the right uh, distribution function for the electrons or the phonons. I'm not sure whether you are taking that into account. Yeah, that's, that's the whole thing. Um, okay, I should uh, have a look at. Uh... Literature, but likely that okay, with screens function, you can maybe get the same result. Yes, 
I think uh, we are a bit running out of time despite the interesting discussion. Thank you very much again, uh, Geneviève, for sharing the nice uh, results. And uh, we then come to the uh, next speaker. This is uh, Clemens Winkelmann from Institut Nail in Grenoble. So can you please uh, share your slides and start? Thank you. So, um, just one second. Okay, yes. Can you see my screen? Can you hear me? Hello, I cannot hear you. So, no, yes, yes, everything fine. Okay, great. <laughs> so, yes, good morning. And yes, thanks to the organizers for bringing us together here in spite of everything. So, I would like to speak a bit about um, some experiments we have been doing in Grenoble about heat transport and thermal power in quantum dot devices uh, at very low temperatures. And what is a bit peculiar here is that we're rather looking into devices that have a rather strong tunnel coupling. So um, with this, okay. Um, so as many people in the session, we're trying to take advantage of uh, putting an imbalance, not only on the chemical potentials uh, in the leads that are connecting some quantum object, but we also put in a thermal imbalance there. And we're looking at the response of the electrical, but also of the heat current to these two gradients there. And the, the quantities that are important are the electrical conductance, the Zeebeck coefficient, and the thermal conductance. And uh, so just to remind the way I, I, I like to look at the Zeebeck coefficient. So, uh, basically, if one side is hot, so which I plot here, then uh, hot electrons from this side here, if they are coupled to a, to a single quantum level, uh, I might get in the situation current against the bias, although this guy is a bit higher. So that means I will have some current flowing. So what I have to do is I, I have to increase this bias until I have here a balance of electrons going back and forth and a zero uh, net current. So this is thermal power. And um, well, I, I won't have time to go into the way this is calculated in the linear response regime, but there are a couple of messages uh, that, are, that are important, I think. So first of all, the electrical conductance is probing at low temperatures the amplitude of the spectral function of this object connecting my two leads at the Fermi level, at zero energy. Whereas uh, the thermal power is sensitive not to the amplitude, but to the slope of this uh, spectral function. And this is giving rise to what we know to be Mott's law. Okay, if you can take this here, you can write this also as a uh, logarithmic derivative. But the main message here is that we're probing the slope. And um, this was already recognized some time ago that if you want a good thermoelectric, you want something with a very, very spiked um, spectral function. And of course, you don't want to be sitting on top of the spike. You want to sit on the sides to get some electron hole asymmetry to maximize the slope. And you can also re do the same thing for, uh, for the thermal conductance. Now, if, assuming that thermoelectric effects are not too large, uh, you can show that uh, here, the thermal conductance is again connected to the amplitude of the spectral function. And then you, if you take the ratio of conductance, these two conductances at a given temperature, you find the constant value. This is the wiedemann franz law. And our goal is going to be to probe these in a variety of, uh, of quantum devices. So um, I would say that over the last 10 years, there have been quite a few experiments uh, revisiting or uh, deepening actually uh, quantum transport physics from a thermal and thermoelectric point of view. So this is just uh, to show you a few examples. So here we have uh, quantum hall physics being probed by thermal conductance and compared to wiedemann franz law. Uh, we have here uh, systems with uh, Coulomb interactions and, uh, and while this is a nice work where quantum dot junctions are used as uh, as heat engines. So um, there's, there's still lots of room for 
for uh, discovering new physics by looking at these systems from a thermal point of view. And uh, what we're uh, doing is about quantum dot junctions. So I will show you basically two experiments, uh, one in which we will measure the thermal power through a condo correlated quantum dot junction. And the second one is, um, is another quantum dot junction with slightly less coupling. So no condo effect there, but there we, we have measured the, the temperature response to the device parameters and we measure the heat valve effect. So uh, let me start with, uh, with the thermal power measurements and say a word about how the experiments are done. So first of all, for connecting quantum dots, what we do is electromigration. So we take a constriction on a chip and we break it in a somewhat controlled manner by passing a high current density there. And then there's actually several methods for inserting a quantum dot in there. So this here is, uh, is a nice image, but this quantum dot is actually too big to yield anything interesting. But when the quantum dot is smaller, then the image is not as nice. So this is why I put this here. Uh, eventually, what tells you if you have a nice quantum dot or not are the transport measurements. So uh, what I would like to emphasize is that actually by this method, you can connect very small uh, objects, so single molecules, or in our case, it will be three to five nanometer gold quantum dots. Um, and um, so this is similar to what people do in STM or mechanical brake junctions. Uh, uh, the disadvantage of our technique is that you cannot really control very much the tunnel couplings, but there's uh, also an advantage, which is that you can put everything on chip on top of a local gate. So we have a full gate control of our device. So this is illustrated by these two plots here where we see Coulomb diamonds and uh, I mean, these uh, single electron levels there, Zeeman splitting of these levels. Um, the second important ingredient for our experiments is local electronic thermometry. So, uh, and this we want to perform in the 100 millikelvin range. So here our strategy is to use superconducting normal metal hybrid junctions. So there's um, two regimes, basically. You can be in a tunneling regime or in a Josephson regime. In both cases, you can uh, get your junctions to have uh, temperature dependent transport properties. So I will not go too much into the details of this. And uh, this is sensitive to the temperature in the normal metal. So by measuring the conductance of such a junction like shown here, we are able to assess the temperature in this piece of normal metal that is drawn here. Okay, and um, also another uh, good reason for us to use superconductors here for thermometry is that actually having these lead superconducting allows us to thermally isolate this from, from the outside world quite a bit because actually these leads are very good conductors, but uh, superconductors are thermal insulators at low temperatures. Okay, so um, just a few reminders about what you expect from thermal power in a quantum dot junction. Basically, as we said before, uh, you have to apply a voltage. If you have a cold side and a hot side, the cold side is actually somewhat obliged to follow the dot level. If I drag this up and down by the gate voltage to keep a zero current flowing between the two leads. And uh, sorry, and this leads to this uh, sawtooth pattern where you have this linear relation on, of the Zeebeck coefficient uh, on, on the average uh, carrier number there, and then it switches back to the next charge state. So, uh, however, in this region here, a thermal power is, uh, is very poorly defined because there is, I mean, very, very little electrons tunneling here anyways. So very quickly, as soon as you move away from the degeneracy point between two charge states, uh, there's actually co-tunneling effects that are sort of uh, shorting this uh, sequential uh, physics here, sequential tunneling physics. And then what you get is this uh, wiggly shape of the thermal power around each degeneracy point. But of course, uh, what is important to keep in mind here is that we have basically the same pattern every time we add a new charge to the system. And this is something we see in experiments. So here, this is a weakly coupled uh, quantum dot junction, and this is the, the conductance map here. Now, let's. This is taken without 
temperature gradient. Now let's, room, let's zoom onto this region here and apply a temperature difference between the two sides. And um, so what we see here is that now I'm plotting the current, we see these regions here that we have already seen of ne negative current and positive current that are somewhat interpenetrating here. If I take a line cut here at a constant bias through this, I see these uh, thermal current curves, which, uh, which we can model, which are well understood. And uh, from this map, we can also at the same time extract the thermal voltage by just defining thermal voltage at the place where the current is zero, because everywhere here the current is small, but there is still a finite slope here, and we can determine where the current goes to zero, and this is the definition of this uh, thermal voltage there. Okay, so um, now let me say a word about an effect of, uh, that appears in, in quantum transport, which is the condo resonance. So let's assume I have a lead and uh, a quantum dot connected to it and have this uh, level here singly occupied. There is a finite tunnel coupling, so that means I get some level broadening here. But if I have an odd number of electrons here, or actually any, I mean, other kinds of degeneracies, but let's talk about this uh, spin degeneracy. So I have a spin doublet state here. In that case, theory predicts that I get an extra resonance right at the Fermi level, which is quite sharp. And there's another energy scale appearing in the system. So this is called the condo resonance. It's not connected to any, uh, I mean, not directly connected to any orbital state here. It's really something that is, people always say it's pinned to the Fermi level of this uh, Fermi C that is uh, talking to this to the system here. And this was observed in a variety of systems. And uh, I have an example here from a single molecule junction where you see here a degeneracy point between two charge states. And here, obviously, the left side corresponds to an odd electron occupation. So here there's the last electron is in a doublet state. Here it's in a we have an even number of electrons and this doublet state is producing here this condo resonance at the Fermi level. Now, if we recall what I said in the beginning that thermal power is sensing the slope of the spectral function, uh, one would naively say that actually you don't expect any signal from the condo effect in thermal power because you have a peak that is centered at the Fermi level. But if you look um, a bit closer into the calculations. So here I show you some calculations from an NRG uh, system here. Um, so this is, this is my, my state, which is below the Fermi level. Here, this is the Hubbard satellite for double uh, occupation quite far above the Fermi level. And at low temperature, we have this condo resonance appearing here and uh, at the Fermi level. But if I look closer into this, what I see is that actually the condo resonance is not exactly at the Fermi level. It's slightly off. Um, you could think of this as a little bit of a repulsion from this peak as we're there. Uh, only when these two peaks are symmetric about the Fermi level, then the condo resonance is also exactly at the, uh, at the Fermi level. So this is what happens at the center of a Coulomb diamond. Okay, so the other important observation here is that, uh, of course, this condo resonance is very rapidly collapsing when you increase temperature. So this is what we see here. And uh, now there's two important consequences of this. First of all, we actually do expect um, a signature of condo physics in the thermal power. Um, this should change sign whether we are here or here. So this should be anti-symmetric with respect to the center of the Coulomb diamond. And when I increase temperature, you see that because this peak is collapsing, I'm going here from a positive to a negative slope. So that means that as a hallmark of condo physics, I expect a sign change of thermal power at um, increasing temperatures. So to summarize this, uh, this is what I plotted here. This is basically what we expect. We, are, we have lost this uh, 1E periodicity. We have something that is now more a changing sign when we go from even to odd because of this alternation. And, 
Yes. Um, so let's move to the experiments. So this is how our sample looks. So this is a sort of an electrode here that is thermally insulated, but electrically connected. Here, this is our break junction where we hope to find a quantum dot, and this is the drain electrode, okay? And we heat, we overheat this region here by applying a current from here to here. And in some cases, not in this experiment, we can also measure the temperature here. This is how the conductance map looks like. So here we see a series of degeneracy points here. And if I zoom into this one, for example, I see like in this other data I said I showed you, we see here a tail going at zero bias into this diamond. So we assign this an, an odd occupation number and here this is even and here you see the next tail coming in, which is also appearing here again. So this is again an oddly occupied diamond. So this looks like condo physics. If we track the dependence of the conductance here as a function of temperature, we can fit this nicely with a known temperature dependence. So we're quite sure that this is really a condo effect. And now let's look at the um, thermal power signature of this. So as we're going from this oddly occupied region to even and odd again at different temperatures, this is the thermal power that we measure. And so what we see here is first of all, we indeed see this sign alternation as we go from odd to even to even to odd. So it's really anti-symmetric with respect to the center. Uh, of course, the signal is decreasing overall uh, in, in the, uh, I mean, when we decrease the temperature. But importantly, when we look into the oddly occupied uh, diamonds here, so for example here, when we are uh, increasing temperature, we're starting here from a positive S and we're going to a negative one. And this is exactly what is expected from theory. So here theory is again, an RG made by Theo Costi. So uh, in conclusion from this part here is that we really probe the condo resonance from a thermal electric point of view. We see this little slope there because the condo peak is not exactly at the Fermi level and it gives the right dependence with respect to theory. Now let me move to heat transport measurements. So we are moving a bit out of time. Okay, well, in that case, how, how much time do I have? Basically, um, should I stop? We have three Sorry. five minutes, including questions. Okay, well, maybe then I will go very fast on this. I just want to show you this last result here. So basically, this is a quantum dot junction here where we now measure the temperature um, as a function of so I will skip this. These are data where we measured heat transport in a single electron transistor. And let me just briefly spot this, uh, this last experiment. So here we have a quantum dot junction. We are measuring temperature as a function of bias and gate here. And what we find is this uh, Coulomb diamond pattern again. So we're starting from a temperature of 165 because we overheat this region here slightly. The base temperature is 80 millikelvin. What we see is that when the device is operating, we are heating things. So this is just a jowl dissipation. So here we have a temperature map of this Coulomb diamond pattern. And when we drive the device to its degeneracy point, then actually heat can flow through this. So we are actually operating this uh, quantum dot as, as a heat valve. So when we're going through here, we're actually cooling this region by uh, putting this on, on resonance. Uh, I can also show you a zoom on this region here where we see that when we're at the degeneracy point, we can actually cool, so allow heat to flow through the device without producing any heating. And this agrees nicely with some um, theory of using non-equilibrium Green's functions. So um, uh, what I want to stress here is that actually, if this quantum dot was sequentially tunneled, uh, then all tunneling would be elastic and there would be no heat transport. So the important ingredient for understanding this effect is inelastic co-tunneling. Without this, you cannot let any heat flow there. And this, with this, I will finish here. And just, yes, this is my summary. I have a few outlooks with nanowires, time resolved thermometry, and these are the people who have contributed. Thank you. 
Thank you very much for this very interesting presentation. So now we have time for a short question. Raise your hand or write in the chat as you prefer. Perhaps while uh, you think, uh, okay, Fabian Pauli has a question, please. I, I, I'm wondering, okay, I find it very nice to see this um, condo, level, uh, condo level there. Do you think it's um, detrimental or positive for thermoelectricity? Because in principle, you want to increase um, electron hole asymmetries for increasing the thermal power. Yes. Um, okay, l let me think. Um, so basically, um, the first thing I would be tempted to say is that when you increase the tunnel coupling, generically, without talking about condo, you, are, you will decrease thermoelectricity because your, your spectral features are less sharp. Um, so that, that is the first effect. If you want to have very large thermal voltage, then you need some a sequentially coupled system. So something with a very sharp resonance. Now, uh, with respect to these very uh, wide single levels here, which are broadened by hybridization, the condo effect is actually, uh, again, sharper so it produces a higher signal um, but of course i wouldn't try to sell this for applications here we're just but, but, but i mean this peak is precisely kind of centered it seems well slightly shifted but then only by increasing the temperature when you wash out the resonance you um you get the asymmetry stronger between electrons and holes so i'm i'm actually a bit skeptical about um, using the condo effect then for high for increasing thermal power yeah, I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't want to sell this for. Uh, I, I'm. I'm not saying that this is a good thermoelectric. Anyways, it's it's very complicated to to settle. So I think. Yeah. I I mean, well, anyway, it's yeah. It's very interesting to explore this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. So then, uh, thank you again, Clemens, and uh, we then move to the next uh, speaker, uh, Giuliano Benenti from Como. Share your screen. Yes. Okay. Is it? Okay, maybe I can just one second. I can put full screen. Maybe it's better. I don't know. Um, Okay, so first of all, I would like uh, to thank uh, the organizers for bringing us uh, together, uh, well, in spite of the present situation. So um, this is um, a talk on um, about um, fundamental uh, bounds, fundamental constraints uh, from thermodynamics on uh, the uh, performance of a heat engine. So I will uh, mainly focus uh, on uh, steady state heat engines on thermoelectricity uh, for concreteness. And uh, I will discuss uh, thermodynamic uncertainty relations in that uh, context, uh, highlighting the role of interactions. And then if I have time, I will briefly discuss uh, periodic, the opposite regime, if you want, periodically driven heat engines in the anti-adiabatic regime. Um, so as a general consideration, uh, the upper bound to efficiency is given by Carnot efficiency. And you expect physically that you obtain uh, such efficiency if you have a quasi-static transformation. This requires infinite time. And so you have a uh, zero extracted power. Um, then is it uh, really so? Uh, so uh, let's start with the steady state heat engine. This is the some general setup, left and right uh, reservoirs where you fix temperature and electrochemical potential. The flux is one dimensional and you can have a magnetic field uh, breaking time reversibility. These are linear response uh, equations. So you have thermodynamic forces, voltage and temperature difference and you have uh, conjugated uh, fluxes which are uh, charge and uh, heat flux. So, as I said, you have constraints uh, from thermodynamics. So you have positivity of entropy production, so the second law of thermodynamics. And then uh, within linear response, you have also on Sager-Casimir relations. So if you um, 
write them in terms of uh, trans more familiar transport coefficients. When you put a magnetic field, you have that the Peltier uh, is not necessarily equal to the Seebeck times temperature, but you have to reverse a magnetic field. So in a sense, you relax uh, somehow constraints. So what is the consequence of that uh, on bounds? Uh, well, the first consequence is that when you look at efficiency, at maximum efficiency, for instance, it depends now not just on ZT, but you have two parameters. One is some uh, uh, asymmetry parameter, which is the ratio between Peltier and uh, Seebeck. And then uh, you have a second parameter, yes, is written uh, well, the first X and the second Y, which uh, reduces to ZT if you, uh, if you do not have this asymmetry, basically. So what are the consequences? Consequences is that if you look at power at maximum efficiency, which can be in some, under some condition also Carnot efficiency, you see that you have this uh, difference between uh, off diagonal kinetic coefficients square. And when you have asymmetries, this difference is not equal to zero. So in principle, the second law if you stay within linear response, doesn't uh, forbid you by itself to have uh, uh, Carnot efficiency at finite power. So well, this was some quite old uh, paper which put the question, then the, the question is what is in real life? So if you have non-interacting system with two terminals, uh, then you have a symmetry property of the scattering matrix. So the Seebeck coefficient is always equal to the Peltier or Equivalently, you can say that the Seebeck coefficient is an even function of the magnetic field. Uh, but this symmetry doesn't apply if you have electron phonon or electron electron interaction. So, about electron phonons, uh, well, we started with uh, some phenomenological model. So, you have some uh, boutique or conceptual probe to mimic inelastic scattering. You have a third terminal, and on average, uh, charge and heat flow to this. Um, terminal through this terminal is equal to zero. But then uh, with this terminal, you have inelastic scattering events. And then uh, these, uh, these are some numerical results, these uh, squares, and then you have uh, blue is what you can have uh, uh, from second law of thermodynamics. So in principle, uh, when you have x equal different from one, you have a symmetry. If you hit Carnot efficiency here, then you would get this at finite power. But this was not the case. And indeed, there is a constraint uh, from the unitarity of the S matrix from the entire system, which is stronger than the second law of thermodynamics. You can put more terminals, of course, so the constraints relaxes more and more. But there are numerical evidence that when you approach Carnot efficiency, power goes to zero, which is well, it's what, what we expect uh, intuitively. And then uh, you can have also a different kind of calculation uh, based uh, from this uh, group, uh, based on, uh, uh, well, uh, you have phonon modes uh, coupled to some system, could be a dot, uh, you have magnetic field, and then uh, the point is that you require non-negativity of the entire system, or the, or the original entire free terminal junction. And this gives you that you cannot go to Carnot, basically. Uh, so far, so good. Then you can ask about what about if, uh, besides phonons, I include electron electron interaction? Two terminal system, but I include electron electron interaction. And this seems, well, this is some recent result we had, uh, we published this year. It seems that on Saga reciprocal relations are much more general than expected so far. This is quite a general uh, one in classical setup, but it's quite general interacting system. And then uh, these are uh, uh, simulation with uh, different um, magnetic field with uh, uh, well, quite a symmetric depth dependence in uh, two and three dimensional systems. And uh, well, we have also some theoretical argument to, well, that suggests that in general, you cannot break uh, uh, on Sager reciprocal relation even when you have interactions. So it seems quite general, the, the point that you do not achieve uh, Carnot efficiency at final power. And well, indeed, uh, there was a, a result uh, uh, for system described as Markov processes, 
that the u that the power is less or equal than some uh, prefactor times the difference between uh, Carnot efficiency and the efficiency that you achieve. So this tells you that when you go to uh, approach Carnot efficiency, power goes to zero. The problem is that this uh, prefactor is not a universal number, but it's system dependent. So in principle, uh, you have system like the one uh, considered by Campisi and Fasco, where you approach a phase transition and this prefactor diverges. So power uh, is not bounded to go to zero. But then uh, if you want to characterize the performance of a heat engine, uh, it's not enough to look at efficiency and power, but you want also some constancy from your engine. So it's also important that you look at fluctuation. So small fluctuation is a key ingredient for a heat engine. And the point is that uh, uh, when you approach a phase transition, these uh, fluctuation diverge and this make a little bit impractical, this such kind of engine. Actually, these were formalized in the setup of uh, thermodynamic uncertainty relations. And the uh, bound was uh, derived by uh, Piezonk and Seifert. Uh, if you consider state, st steady state stochastic heat engines that can be modeled as a, a rate equation or overdamped uh, Langevin dynamics. So uh, you, um, while well, you assume that there is no magnetic field also. And if you apply thermodynamic uncertainty relation for work power, for work current, that is from power, you get this uh, inequality, sigma P is power, sigma is entropy production, delta P is fluctuation, uh, power fluctuation. Now, if you express uh, entropy production rate, uh, sigma, then you get a trade-off between the three desiderata of heat engine in terms of uh, uh, power um, efficiency, how close you are to Carnot efficiency and fluctuation. So uh, this Q is a kind of quality factor, is a, a smaller equal than one half. This means that you cannot have at the same time uh, large power efficiency that goes to uh, approach Carnot efficiency as more fluctuation. At least one of these three quantities must be uh, not as you desire, I mean. Uh, but this was a stochastic uh, uh, model. So the point is uh, uh, what can you do uh, if you consider dynamics? So first of all, we consider scattering theory. So we express charge and heat currents in terms of transmissions. We can write efficiency. And then you can ask, well, some optimization was performed a few years ago by Rob Whitney. Uh, he asked the question, find the transmission function that optimizes uh, the efficiency for your uh, heat engine for a given output power. And then it turns out that it is a boxcar uh, function, which uh, shrinks to a delta function transmission when you approach Carnot, and it becomes a step function when you go to maximum power. And uh, then you can compute for this transmission function, you can compute power fluctuations, you can use a levitov lesovic cumulant generating function. And then you get uh, uh, this result. Uh, well, uh, this is, uh, uh, you have quantum, you can derive also classical results because you can adapt this derivation uh, with Boxfire transmission function to classical mechanics. And then you can expand also analytically and you have this red curve read the straight line uh, when you are close to Carnot efficiency. And the point is that you approach uh, three over eight uh, when you approach Carnot efficiency, which is smaller than one half. So you have a bound which is uh, stricter when you approach Carnot efficiency because to approach Carnot efficiency, you need this boxcar function. And you have a bound which is stricter than the one derived from uh, stochastic thermodynamics. So the question is, can you do better if uh, uh, you, inter you add interactions uh, to the business? And then what we found is that actually you can do better. Um, and we consider a system with uh, elastic collisions, classical system with elastic collisions. 
This is the simplest model, but you can consider other model. The important point is that you have a least elastic collision. You have, a, you have a, an equal masses which collide. You have reservoir. When they um, arrive at a reservoir, they are absorbed. In the reservoir, you put, uh, you, you define uh, temperature and electrochemical potential, and that gives you the injection rate into the system. And then you have that uh, um, thermal electrical conductivity is ballistic. Thermal conductivity is anomalous. Uh, thermal power saturates with the system size when you increase the system size. So the ratio electrical over thermal conductivity diverges with the system size. This means that you approach Carnot efficiency. So you have an interacting system where you approach Carnot efficiency. The point is that can you do better with this trade-off function? And actually this is the case because you increase the system size you, put this, you plot this trade-off function as a function of efficiency. Um, this loop are because you start with uh, zero efficiency at uh, uh, zero voltage, then you increase the efficiency, you have some maximum efficiency, then you, when you increase again the voltage, you reduce efficiency up to the stopping voltage. And you see that when you increase more, uh, further and further uh, the system size, you can go above this uh, three over eight, which is the bound from scattering theory and approach more and more uh, the one half, which you can find, uh, uh, well, it is uh, what you get uh, uh, in the limit at the thermodynamic limit, which correspond to this uh, ZT, the figure of merit with diverges. And uh, well, then if I have uh, another uh, couple of minutes, uh, well, the chairman uh, says so, and okay, one minute, say. Just a we sketch, so this is some work in progress. The point is that it can do better than this uh, uh, bound. Uh, well, you have this bound uh, on Q for steady state. Can we do better if we have a periodic driving, if you go beyond the steady state? And actually, this is the case where this is a model, this is isothermal heat engine. So it's a work converter you attach to some uh, reservoir. So, uh, uh, well, you have driving, of course, periodic driving. I do not have time to enter into details. Uh, but uh, the point uh, is that in this case, you can have that you approach, now the ideal efficiency is efficiency equal to one because it's isothermal engine. You can approach in the quasi-static limit, but also in the opposite, anti-adiabatic anti limit. And the other limit is the most interesting one because in that limit, the power doesn't go to zero. It increases linearly with frequency. And at the same time, uh, the relative fluctuation goes to zero. So you have all three desiderata of a heat engine. Uh, there are required ingredients. I have no time to discuss here. And required in ingredients are again, breaking of time reversal symmetry again and you need uh, to go beyond over damped approximation as in stochastic thermodynamics. You need something, you need under damped dynamics, you need something which is beyond the stochastic thermodynamics. Uh, well, that's it, final remarks I can skip. Uh, I thank you for your attention. Okay, thank, you. Yeah, thank you very much for the interesting talk. Um, now we have time for questions. Please either raise your hand that we can unmute you or write your questions in the chat. Perhaps while waiting for questions, can I briefly ask one? So you are uh, bound three over eight. Is this in the linear or nonlinear response regime? No, no, this, uh, this is, is nonlinear response. Non uh, I follow, I compute for the boxcar function, which optimizes power for a given efficiency. But this is a nonlinear response result. Okay. But it's for a specific transmission function. Well, it's the, it's the one which optimizes power for yeah. a given efficiency is the only way to approach Carnot. Yeah. So I mean, if you want to approach Carnot, for sure you do not overcome this bound. If you are far from Carnot, uh, you could, of course. But, uh, okay. but I mean, I am interested uh, when the, the engine becomes efficient. That, uh, of course. If you, if you say that is a matter of, of principle, and that's the point. Okay. Are there more questions? Not in the chat. If not, then
then I think uh, we thank you again, Julian, for a very nice, interesting presentation. And the uh, next speaker is uh, Maria Luisa de la Roca from Université Paris Bilbao. Okay, so if you can share mm -hmm. your slide. Okay. okay. Thank you, please. Thank you very much. So good morning to everyone. So uh, first I would like to thank you the organizers for uh, giving me this possibility uh, to present our recent work in this nice and interesting virtual conference. Uh, so I will present now this, to uh, this um, work about thermal conductivity, a measurement of supported graphene nanowires. So a uh, multi-layer nanowire of graphene which are on a substrate. Uh, to give you my motivation, I just present here again something that you know very well, all of you, uh, which is related to uh, energy conversion efficiency at low dimension, and in particular by using uh, bidimensional material. You know that the figure of merit is an important parameter in playing a role, which depends on the CB coefficient, electrical conductivity, the temperature, working temperature, and uh, the thermal conductivity, including electron and phononic terms. And the high value of ZT are necessary in order to increase energy conversion efficiency. And uh, generally, during the time, uh, it has been well uh, demonstrated that by working on uh, new materials, by playing on the electronic structure, uh, on the density of state of material, for example, uh, 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 lead telluride or bismuth telluride, silicon germanium, or new material, this uh, incrementation of the ZAT value has come during the time with maximum value of the order of 2 to 0.5 actually, which correspond to uh, energy conversion efficiency, which are of the order of 50-20%. So in this context, uh, uh, B-dimensional material and 2D materials open new uh, pathways because we can do a lot of engineering, for example, by heterostructure. Uh, structing, and also we can play on uh, uh, intentional defects on this material, or for example, uh, on grafting, and we really can manipulate the density of states. Uh, so uh, this is now the outline of my talk. I will uh, present so the, the case uh, of uh, the application of a methodology which is quite simple in, princip in principle, which is the Joseph fitting method on uh, graphene nanowire made of um, multi-layer graphene. First, I will make a point just of uh, in, um, uh, the state of the art about the measurement of the thermal conductivity in graphene. I will present the method and an example of one of the samples that we measure and the results with some conclusion and perspective. So as you know, one of the first measurement of the thermal conductivity of uh, uh, single layer graphene has been done by Balandan in 2008 by uh, the Raman optothermal spectroscopy uh, on graphene which was suspended in between two contacts and uh, essentially by measure the G peak position shift as a function of the power of the laser beam uh, on the sample uh, and by solving the transport equation, uh, it was extracted the thermal conductivity which is really very high of the order of 5,000 watt per meter Kelvin. And this is not so uh, interesting for a thermoelectric application, more for electron cooling at the nanoscale. But in fact, as we put graphene on uh, substrate, uh, change, uh, things change because uh, interaction with substrate uh, they play an important role. And this is also one very known work in 2010 where uh, the thermal conductivity of graphene was measured by uh, the micro resistance thermometry technique. And, uh, in a wide temperature range from low temperature to uh, room temperature, we see that the, this value has gone down by one order of magnitude with respect to the suspended case. So in this uh, third graph, I just represent a kind of summary, uh, which is extracted from literature of the measurement of the thermal conductivity in different kind of uh, carbon-based materials. And in particular, you can see really that in the suspended monolayer case of graphene, we have uh, high value which are comparable with graphite and diamond and lower value are obtained with uh, the supported case in the single layer uh, case of, gra of, of graphene on, on a substrate 
orosin and casein three layer graphene and the lowest one for uh, uh, graphene nanoribbons uh, on a substrate. And also we can know that in the temperature range, uh, which is unusual for, uh, for this uh, uh, mini conference, but which is uh, above room temperature, there are not too much data in the supported case. And this is the, 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 the range of temperature where we have to decide to investigate, to give our investigation. So about the method. Uh, the method is the Jossel heating method uh, we have, we, that we have not invented at all. And it consists in the fact to realize graphene and wire uh, connected to metal contact and uh, uh, crossed by a steady state current. Uh, and then we uh, obtain, in fact, Jossel uh, heating in the nanowire, and it is essentially dissipated by the substrate. But depending on the length of the nanowire, also the metal contact can play a role. Uh, so by solving the transport equation and taking into account thermal losses to the substrate uh, that you see here, where you see uh, the, the, ter the term proportional to the thermal conductivity of the nanowire, where A is the, the cross-section of the nanowire, P prime is uh, uh, the uh, dissipated power per unit length, and alpha uh, the temperature coefficient of the resistance, and G represents thermal losses through the substrate per unit length. So I was saying by solving this equation, we can calculate uh, the average temperature rise due to uh, cell, uh, joule heating, and also consequentially also the um, average resistance of the nanowire. So the idea is to measure the relative variation of the resistance of the nanowire with respect to the resistance when low heating occurs, so at low current, which depends on different parameters and known parameters, which are G, the thermal loss through substrate, K, uh, the thermal conductivity of the nanowire, and alpha, which can be uh, measured a priori, in fact, in the, in the sample. An important point also uh, to well define the device geometry is uh, to take into account uh, the, an important length scale, which is the thermal healing length, which is the length scale for lateral heat flow uh, to the contact. And is defined as the square root of uh, the ratio between the thermal conductivity, uh, the width of the nanowire, the height of the nanowire, and thermal losses through the substrate. So it has been demonstrated that for long device, meaning device longer than three times the thermal healing length, dissipation is essentially to the graphene substrate interface. While for short device in the opposite limit, uh, substantial cooling through the metal contact start to play a role. Uh, another important point also uh, is that we can reduce uh, the thermal losses through the substrate by also playing to the, um, with the width of the nanowire with respect to the thickness of uh, the oxide layer on which the nanowire is supported. This is uh, an empirical formula which is generally used to give an estimation of thermal losses. So by inserting the uh, value of parameter that we have chosen for our fabrication procedure, where 300 nanometer is the width of the nanowire and five micron is the thickness of the oxide layer, and this is a posteriori also the thickness of the sample that I show and the parameters that are extracted from the literature, we find out value for uh, three times the healing length of uh, 2.7. So, which means that this is the limit for uh, the definition in uh, this case of long and short device. So if we uh, simulate the temperature profile as function of uh, uh, the nanowire length for a long and short case, we can see uh, something which is at, at uh, the art of the method we have applied that uh, in fact, this, uh, this profile, uh, by simulating them, by fixing the uh, thermal conductivity and bearing the G parameter and vice versa, we clearly show that in the long limit, uh, we have a big influence of the G parameter, while in the short limit, this influence is reduced and we start to have uh, an effect which can be uh, detected in the profile uh, by varying the K parameter. So this can uh, help in understanding the method used, which is to measure simultaneously 
the uh, relative variation of uh, uh, the resistance of the nanowire for a short and the long nanowire as I've defined, and to make a, a fitting procedure, which is, in, uh, uh, which is uh, a looped procedure, in fact. We start with the, uh, the long nanowire data, and by fixing, fixing the K values extracted from the literature, we can find out the G value, which is inserted in the short nanowire data fitting, uh, allowing to extract the K, to extract the K value. Uh, so this K value can be re-injected again, and we continue in a loop procedure until convergence of this value that arrives typically after 10 or 15 iterations, so not too much. Okay, so now some detail about the sample. And yet you can see uh, uh, the graphene flake, which is uh, uh, essentially reported on a substrate by the hot pickup technique, uh, starting from exfoliated sample. And after, by electron beam lithography and metal evaporation, we evaporate these contacts which are made in titanium gold. And by an etching procedure, we can uh, define the long and short nanowire as close as possible to each other. And these are the dimensions uh, that we have uh, uh, used for this long and short wire. Uh, we uh, also analyzed the sample by AFM and Raman spectroscopy. Uh, so these are AFM image. Uh, I have to say also that, in fact, the silicon oxide has been grown by PUCVD in our clean room. And so we find out by AFM that it, this is a quite a rough uh, surface. And you can see clearly the flake of uh, multilayer graphene and also uh, the different layer appearing. Uh, so this is a quite rough surface. The, uh, the roughness is reduced when we go on, uh, on the graphene layer. And uh, this uh, that does not allow us to uh, measure the thickness by AFM. And so we use Raman spectroscopy. You see here data on the sample that I show you, uh, compared with the literature that allow us that in this particular case, we have a 10 layers, multi-layer, so a thickness of almost 3 nanometers. Okay, measurements are then done under vacuum uh, at uh, temperature higher than room temperature uh, and uh, with a pressure of the order of 10 to minus 7 millibar. And this is the first step of the measurement, which is the calibration of the temperature coefficient of resistance by measuring the resistance as a function of the temperature in for the short and the long nanowire simultaneously. So generally, uh, we can see that we have a, a nice value of the term uh, electrical conductivity, so uh, nice conducting properties. And we see two different trends of this uh, calibration measurement for the short nanowire, a decreasing behavior until the minimum is reached around 550 Kelvin. And then opposite trend with a minimum and after an increasing behavior at higher temperature. Okay, this uh, kind of behavior is not really the focus of, the, of, the, of my talk, but the, in fact, it's scarcely explored in literature, uh, but there is a uh, particular work that has been done on single layer and bilayer graphene showing a uh, quenching in fact of the electrical resistance of uh, the graphene layers at higher temperature that has been related to the thermal generation of electron hole carriers and also to suppression of long range disorder scattering. And uh, in this work, uh, the optical phonon contribution that is expected in the high temperature let predict the resistance minimum, which is not seen. So maybe we are in this context and we are seeing also this kind of minimum and which also seems to depend on the length of the nanowire and also on the interface uh, of uh, properties of the, of the uh, support materials of the silicon oxide. Uh, okay, this is not really the focus of this work, so we decide to um, give uh, our analysis, to uh, realize our analysis in a range where this minimum uh, is not really affecting our measurement, because if you look at the derivative of these fitting curves of uh, the calibration data, uh, which is the temperature resistance uh, coefficient of the resistance that we calculate, uh, we avoid to uh, be uh, quite uh, close to value where this parameter is close to zero. So by restricting this analysis in this temperature range, 
uh, this is an example of uh, uh, data analysis at two temperature in this temperature range for a short wire and a long uh, wire. Uh, you can see the uh, point are the relative variation of the resistance and the continuous line are the result of the fitting procedure, procedure that I show you. And by summarize uh, all uh, the measurements that we have done for this sample, we find out particularly low value of the thermal conductivity of the, in the explored uh, temperature range of the order of 40 watt per meter Kelvin and also value of the thermal losses through the substrate which are in between 0.05 and 0.15 watt per meter Kelvin quite in coherence with our estimation. So these low values are uh, really comparable only, only uh, to the case of the graphene nanoribbons in a supported configuration or for example uh, single layer graphene in an encased uh, configuration and in fact uh, if we just have a look at the model which is widely used the Callaway model to uh, calculate the phonon contribution to the thermal conductivity where uh, the scattering time is uh, the relaxation time is uh, uh, introduced by the Matthiansen rule take into account uh, all different kinds of uh, uh, phonon scattering terms. In fact, this model, which is represented just here, uh, predicts uh, already the de 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 decreasing behavior of the thermal conductivity in the explored temperature range we are here, but in particular by increasing uh, particular impurity scattering, we can really go down with the thermal conductivity. So we don't know really exactly what, is the, what are the reasons of this uh, uh, strong reduction, but we think that this, is, this can be really very interesting uh, for thermoelectric application, for example. Also, a posteriori, we can have an estimation by, with our experimental uh, extraction of uh, this uh, quantity uh, of the thermal healing length, which in the range of temperature explored vary between 0 0.5 and 1, so it allows us to be uh, quite confident in the validity of the application of our short and long limit case. Uh, so to conclude, uh, we have applied this dual self-heating method to the measurement of the thermal conductivity of supported multilayer graphene. This method allows to have insight about the thermal conductivity, even if with the large error bar, I have to say, but it's quite interesting uh, above all because it is uh, very easily implementable on configuration where a, a, a the simultaneous measurement of uh, the CB coefficient and the electrical conductivity can be done in order to have really a complete estimation of the figure of merit. So we have revealed for the moment low value of K and we think that there is a crucial role which is played by the oxide layer in terms of thickness and roughness to reduce thermal losses through the substrate and so uh, also to allow uh, this method to have uh, uh, a valid uh, estimation of K. And so there is a lot of work in progress now because uh, as I said we want really uh, to define a complete geometry we are measuring all these three parameters together for the moment we can measure K and Sigma but the measurement of S is a quite standard uh, uh, experiment that can be done in order to extract the zeta T value and also to apply this method to uh, uh, interesting material like uh, transition metal guitar cogenite for example and there is also this story of the quenching of the uh, um, electrical resistivity in uh, graphene nanowires, which is another topic that we, we, that we want to explore. Okay, thank you very much for, uh, for your uh, attention. Thank you. Thank you very much for the nice presentation. Uh, there's no time for questions. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I don't know if Please I raise can... your hand or write in the chat if you have a question. Okay, Fabian, Pauli, please go ahead. Hi. Um, yeah, I find this talk very interesting. Um, but I have some, some questions. So something that I didn't understand, um, but you said it um, was the G. So what is the G again? Uh, the temperature mean? I don't understand. No, the T. The G. Um, you had this parameter G, which you uh, showed in your plots. Ah. What was that? Uh, sorry, you say the um, thermal losses through the substrate. Ah, I see. Okay. Yeah. I see. And um, let's say how, how strongly do they depend on the device that you are studying because you have such a rough um, silicon oxide surface? Yes, um, the, in fact, general expression which is used in literature for G in the case of uh, this is the general expression which depends, uh, which is related really 
uh, to the case where the width of the nanowires is, uh, uh, is lower than the thickness of, uh, of the oxide layer. So you see that there are parameters that come in play a role which are related to the oxide layer. But this is the strong parameter, which is the interfacial thermal conductivity, with the, which is strongly depends mm -hmm. on, the, on, the, on the property of the surface. So in the case of rough sample, uh, this, this can change a lot, in fact. I and see. also, and also uh, what play a role there is, uh, of course, scattering with the, with the surface of the substrate, uh, which, is, uh, which, is, uh, I, uh, which is in principle uh, increased by the roughness uh, of, the, of the sample. So we, ha we have to, to do some experiment by playing on the, on the different kind of uh, uh, thermal oxide layer here and different quality of the surface in order to get rid of this kind of question, in fact. I see. And the, um, the systems that you've studied so far, they were just a multi-layer graphene, but in the yeah. introduction, didn't you, um, wasn't the introduction where you showed this overview mostly for a single layer graphene? Mm. Uh, yes. So for the moment, we have studied multi-layer and also B-layer. I don't put them in, inside this, uh, this kind of uh, uh, presentation for this short presentation. For the B-layer case, in fact, we have very similar value of the order of uh, 100 watt per meter Kelvin that we have obtained. And we have not yet studied the case of a single layer. Indeed, in fact, our big interest is really to try to do a complete figure of merit characterization of the a low dimensional material, not, not really the, the single layer case is, uh, is interesting, but uh, it, it is more easy to produce a uh, uh, sample with a few layers uh, graphene, in fact. I see, thanks. Thank you, to you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you again, Maria thank Luisa. You. Um, so then thank we um, come to the next uh, speaker. And the next speaker is uh, David Sanchez from uh, Mallorca. Can you share your slides? Hello. Um, Please go ahead. Can you see my screen now? Yes. Okay, thank you, Janine, for the presentation, and thank you for, uh, to our organizers for this unique experience uh, for us. Um, okay, so the, the title of my talk is uh, Nonlinear Chiral Refrigerators. Uh, so here we propose a refrigerator um, device, um, uh, which is based on a quantum hole contactor. That's why it's uh, named Chiral. And also we go beyond the linear response regime. So that's why it's, it's non linear. But I hope all this uh, will become, let's say, uh, clearer uh, during my presentation. Um, so our general motivation here, okay, our, let's say, work could be framed into a common goal of try to find a, a new ways of uh, cooling uh, at the nanoscale particular in uh, microscopic uh, systems. So, uh, um, well, you know that, um, I mean, there have been this uh, TV coefficient and some of power, and we know that just by uh, reciprocity, uh, we can also cool uh, the system by using the Peltier effect, okay? Um, now, a uh, possible uh, way to increase efficiency that has been discussed in the literature in the last few years is to uh, use uh, multiple terminals. Okay? For instance, uh, here you can, let me see if I can put the uh, laser pointer. Uh, yeah, okay. So here we have a sketch of a, well, here it says a quantum dot that you can use uh, any other mesoscopic system, which is coupled to uh, tools with stores and draw terminals with uh, different um, voltage uh, differences or even uh, temperature differences, if you wish. And here uh, there is another uh, couple um, uh, um, quantum conductor. And the, the key point of these um, proposals is that you are able to decouple or to distinguish or between, let's say, electric uh, 
flux and, and heat flux here. And uh, this is a way to increase efficiency. Another um, mechanism field, okay? And this uh, increases efficiency, uh, well, there will be the, the topic of, of another talk, but here, um, let's say, uh, this originates from the fact that the two terminal conductance is uh, Symmetric when you uh, reverse the, the, the magnetic field, but the thermal power or the Peltier response uh, doesn't have to be the case, right? Uh, for instance, when you have uh, elasticity, uh, let's say we can we would like to combine these two two effects or two two ways to increase efficiency, namely uh, more than one more than two terminals and also include um, an external magnetic field, and this is uh, our the, the sketch of uh, a proposal. As I said, we have um, three terminals, right? Uh, here in this case of the source and the drain uh, terminal. Uh, these are current terminals, so you can actually uh, inject the electron from the source and eventually electrons will be uh, drained in terminal uh, two. And this is the extra terminal, which we call probe, um, because uh, the electric current flowing through this the probe terminal will be will be cancelled, um, and eventually this probe or this terminal will be cooled. Okay, by this um, um, by, uh, uh, by by kind of a Peltier effect, which will I will discuss now. Okay. Um, now the advantages of these uh, of our proposals are the following. First of all, the cooling power is is big. Okay, because uh, here we let's say consider the fact that uh, we have an a perpendicular magnetic field. Okay, here we have like a, a feeling factor here is that there is one edge state running through through the sample. Okay, uh, here uh, it's possible to to have uh, long distance cooling. This means that since um, you have a quantum hole conductor, you know that. Um, Electrons can blow through this edge, uh, edge uh, um, regions without losing dissipation. Okay, so the probe can be up to let's say a few millimeters uh, in the in the optimistic case. Uh, another important aspect of this uh, proposal is that uh, there is no direct joule heating in terminal three, and this is quite appealing because uh, usually uh, this kind of uh, dissipation degrades, uh, let's say, the performance of, uh, of any kind of um, working operation that uh, you could uh, imagine in, uh, uh, with these, uh, let's say, microscopic devices. And uh, of course, this is a thermoelectric device, okay? And then as a thermoelectric device, you need some uh, energy-dependent transmission Okay, and the, the way to induce this energy transmission, this energy dependent transmission is by um, depositing these um, gates, these finger gates, uh, the, the red regions here, uh, another tunnel junction in, in the right, so you have two tunnel junctions in a series, and then you will have like a one antidote or just one resonant level. Uh, both in the left part and also in, in the right uh, portion of this, um, of this system. Um, and these, these levels can be uh, at the top, and also can be tuned with uh, with, uh, with gate voltages, okay? So this, you, you can actually manipulate uh, the, the, the power here. So this, uh, I think with this uh, energy diagram, diagram, one can understand why this probe must be, uh, must be cooled, okay? Uh, suppose that we have one voltage applied to source, positive, negative to the drain, so electrons will go first through the dot left 
to the excuse me uh, uh, David uh, since the the, uh, the connection seems to be very bad from can you try to switch off your video okay now if the gates are set in such a way that the level the in, in dot uh, in the left dot is below the Fermi energy and the dot level um, in in the right in the um, um, yes. yes. David, can you try to switch off your video since the quality is very bad of the no, so now also the slides are gone. Now it's okay. So now David is there again. Can, can you try to share your slides again, David? Okay, perfect. Perhaps this works better. Can you hear me now? Okay. Yes. So what I was trying to, to discuss was uh, the operation principle of our device. So electrons from, let's say, terminal one will occupy whole uh, or the let's say, empty state below the Fermi energy in terminal three and electrons uh, going from uh, come uh, essentially from let's say thermally excited state above the uh, above uh, the Fermi energy. So as a consequence, what what, what you can uh, what you do with uh, with this uh, flow is let's say you remove quasi holes and then you remove also quasi electrons and then your Fermi um, function becomes, let's say, more step. Okay, so it's like a, so your 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 system will. Okay. Um, okay, so um, th th this was like the, the the general idea, and now for the for the equations. Well, uh, we use uh, the equation service and scattering matrix approach, um, in, including electronic interactions because we go uh, beyond the linear response uh, regime. Okay, so all the Potentials here are self consistent calculated within a um, mean field uh, uh, with a mean field approximation. And so the main uh, magnitude here is the, the heat current, which can be extracted from uh, terminal three. Okay. And this is what we plot in uh, here in the, in the right panels. Okay. So positive heat means, uh, positive heat flux means that uh, we are extracting heat. Okay, and this is uh, seen uh, in these, let's say, bright uh, regions here, and we increase uh, the voltage applied between terminal one and terminal two. Um, and okay, uh, our expectation is confirmed, right? That when uh, the level of uh, the left dot is uh, negative below the Fermi energy, and the level of the right dot is positive, then we can actually cool. Um, the uh, ter uh, terminal three, okay. Um, so, Janine, how much time do I have? So I would say five minutes. Five minutes, okay. Um, here, uh, in I'm plotting the the cooling power, the the, the heat extracted um, through terminal three. Um, uh, versus the applied voltage to the, the source drain voltage. And you can see that there is a non-monitoring behavior. And the reason for that is that of course, when you increase voltage, you increase the heat, which is extracted from the from terminal three. But this, of course, the, there is a limit, right? Because uh, if voltage increases further, then you are uh, injecting, let's say, electrons, which are let's say, quite hot. And then 
eventually um, terminal three will be heated as well. Okay, so there is an, an optimal value for, for the voltage. Um, and this can be understood within a weekly nonlinear transfer model in which we expand the uh, power in terms uh, up to second order in the, in the voltages, okay? And we, um, okay, I will just go uh, quickly through the calculations uh, to, um, to to this statement that the cooling occurs if the thermal power, because this can be, let's say, reformulated in terms of uh, multi-terminal thermal powers, the thermal power uh, that characterizes the junction between, let's say, the, the first terminal and the third terminal is larger than the thermal power between terminal two and, and terminal three. And in particular, this can be um, accomplished by uh, making, uh, let's say, the thermal power in the left dot positive and the thermal power in the right dot negative. Okay, and this can be tuned, as I said, with, um, uh, with external uh, gate voltages. Um, the agreement between the full numerical calculation and this, uh, uh, let's say, uh, Taylor expansion is, is rather good, especially when the broadening is, is large, where, uh, let's say, the Sommerfeld expansion works. Here we have the coefficient of performance, okay? And we find that the, uh, the coefficient of performance of our refrigerator is big for a small gamma. And this is because, of course, if we have a small gamma, then uh, the thermoelectric properties are, are, are better, okay? Um, and, um, and finally, uh, here we plot the minimum temperature that one could achieve. Um, and uh, as a function of the applied voltage, okay? Again, this is the monotonic due to this interplay between, uh, let's say, uh, large currents, large electric currents and large, uh, and then uh, assuming that the uh, heating, uh, that is to say, equilibrium between uh, phonon uh, heating due to coupling to the, the substrate and the, and the electronic uh, uh, heating or cooling power, then uh, we let's say calculate that the minimum possible temperature uh, is of the order of uh, 60 uh, millikelvin for this 100 for a base temperature of uh, 150 millikelvin. Okay, and uh, with this I thank you for your attention and sorry for this uh, bad uh, connection and um, yeah that's it okay thank you very much uh, david uh, for the interesting talk despite the little problems with the connection i think we could fo follow all all your uh, interesting results so now there's um time for questions please either raise your hand or, or write in the chat Yes. Uh, can you hear me or? Uh, yes, I can hear you. I, so now there is actually a, a question from Alessandro Braggio, uh, who says how you who wants to know how you estimate the thermal coupling between edges and background. Okay, so um, it seems that we lost David with this question. So then, then I repeat the question. Ah, there, David, there. Yes, the question is uh, how you estimate the thermal coupling between edge states and background. Uh, what do you mean by thermal Background is substrate. Ah, okay. Uh, this is just, uh, I mean, uh, the, these parameters are, are taken from let's say, uh, from, from the tables. I mean, this is just, uh, of course, I mean, the minimum temper will depend on this, on this coupling, uh, but I mean, we take just, um, I mean, you can uh, take any uh, uh, textbook on semiconductors and then all these parameters, um, I mean, uh, yes, can be just used for that. Okay. 
Thank you. Then since since we are running a bit uh, short in time, I think then with this, uh, thank you, David, again. And uh, I introduce the last speaker of the se session. This is Andrei Valamov uh, from Rome. So if you can share your slides. Uh, you, um, I think you first have to unmute yourself also. Or... Mute. Yes. Is that okay now? Uh, we can hear you, but we cannot see your slides. Yes, my slide is here. And uh, uh, okay, please. Thank you now. Ahead. Yes, please. Ah, okay. So, uh, hello, everybody. Thank you for this invitation. And I want to speak today about the nerve signal oscillations induced by the H currents in Corbina geometry. Um, this work was uh, accomplished in cooperative co with uh, Boris Altshuler, Alexei Kavokin, Sergei Sharapov, and Philippe Grigorian. So uh, I will start a little bit uh, uh, from a uh, long time ago. In uh, one, 200 years ago, the Johann Ziebeck discovered what we call today the thermoelectricity. Uh, he called it another way, but does not matter. And um, the uh, Ziebeck effect, uh, in metals, uh, usually is very small. It is larger in uh, the uh, semiconductors. And now we um, have a European project Magenta where we look for indeed giant uh, Vbeck effects in electrolytes. So today, this is a uh, topic, the thermoelectricity is a topic uh, important for community and uh, I will uh, say several words about the uh, description of heat electron transport equa uh, equations in kinetic approach. It is enough to write equations for electricity, for electric current and heat current as an expansion for the small electric field and gradient of temperature, so ju just expansion. And then, uh, let's say Boltzmann equation allows us to calculate the uh, tensors, thermoelectrical tensor, conductivity tensor, heat, capacity, uh, heat conductivity tensors. And uh, in result, you can get or draw the formula for conductivity or the mod formula for Zeebeck coefficient. Another approach is, uh, of course, this is good for free electrons, how to take into account interactions. So to take into account interactions, uh, for instance, it is possible to use Kubo formalism. So to calculate the correlator of two green functions and to um, find in the approximation of uh, the um, uh, um, response theory, you can express the uh, tensors of thermoelectricity, conductivity, and heat conductivity in terms of corresponding correlators. Very good. Uh, in 1886, uh, the Nernst, Walter Nernst, who got Nobel Prize in chemistry for thermoelectricity, discovered uh, some generalization of thermoelectricity in magnetic field. Namely, when you apply to this uh, conducting film magnetic field, so and you apply gradient of temperature, so electric field appears, or electric current depends on the boundary conditions, appears in the system. So you can generate the electric field as a response on the simultaneously applied magnetic field in gradient of temperature. The corresponding uh, phenomenon is characterized usually by the so-called NERST coefficient, which is the uh, which characterize the strengths of the re uh, response of the system. So what electric field appears uh, when you apply magnetic field H and gradient of temperatures. In some sense, you can consider the triad between whole Z back and Nernst coefficient, the link between three transport properties in a Fermi liquid. The whole effect couples charge and magnetic flux. The Zeebeck effect couples charge and entropy. The Nernst effect couples magnetic flux and entropy. Very good. Uh, 
in the last two decades, the Nernst effect attracted attention because usually the Nernst effect is also small because uh, Z back coefficient is small. So usually these are some uh, um, uh, uh, more or less the same value of Z back coefficient, but for one test. Uh, the ONG group in 1999 found that in uh, the underdoped superconductors, uh, high temperature superconductor in uh, lanthanum strontium uh, uh, copper O4, in uh, the pseudogap phase was found the giant Nernst effect, which exceeded the background value 500 times. And uh, this group attracted uh, this giant effect to the formation of some pseudo vertices in pseudogap phase. So uh, something hypothetic. Uh, five years later, uh, Kamran Benya group uh, demonstrated that in conventional superconductor, namely in niobium silicium with critical temperature only 38 Kelvin, uh, they, they observed above TC the huge Nernst signal, which exceeded the normal state estimation 2,000 times. So it became clear that the problem is not in specifics of high temperature superconductors. This is a fact more is related with the uh, superconducting transition and with fluctuations. So people started to study uh, the contribution of fluctuations to the Nernst effect above critical point and uh, it was found, uh, so the phenomenon was explained, yet just mentioned by me approach to calculate corresponding diagram for aslamazov larkin process or density of state. So taking into account all diagrams gave you good result close to TC, but close to HC2 at low temperatures, such linear response calculations resulted in the violation of the third law of thermodynamics. You just calculating from diagrams the contribution to the uh, thermoelectric coefficient, you um, faced the problem with uh, the um, third law of thermodynamics. Namely, the thermodynamic processes did not go to zero. So to resolve this problem, we uh, um, used the results of Abrastsov, Yuri Abrastsov, who in 1964 um, attracted attention to the fact that when you speak about heat current, it is necessary besides the transport part to take into account the magnetization contribution to heat currents. What does it mean? It means that if you calculate the uh, heat and you have to take into account appearance of uh, the, uh, okay, it is well known that um, you, if you calculate magnetization, it is a Landau problem of 1930 that some uh, H currents uh, flow. But when you have gradient of temperature, H current from one side doesn't compense completely H current from other side. And we took into account this magnetization currents and all was fitted. No problems with thermodynamics and with Ansager relations. Uh, nevertheless, uh, the same problem appeared uh, 10 years later when we calculated the uh, contribution to uh, the um, uh, uh, spin, um, spin transport. Again, so the problem of magnetization currents is very generic. At the same time, um, the, some authors uh, um, uh, negated the uh, importance of these magnetization currents. So 
uh, our vision of the problem was that uh, even in thermodynamic approach, you can relate um, the uh, one part of uh, the Nernst coefficient with the derivative of chemical potential over T, like in uh, the Kelvin formula for Zeebeck coefficient. But it is necessary to take into account contribution of magnetization currents, the derivative of magnetization currents. Uh, in order to put the full stop in this uh, controversy, we decided to invent some geometry where there are no, there is no kinetic approach at all. So we wanted to find some system where the Nernst effect will be only due to magnetization currents. And the idea was to consider um, magnetization currents in Laughlin geometry. Laughlin geometry means that you take a cylinder, apply some magnetic field as a hedgehog. Uh, so this is Hedan Gedanken experiment. You cannot create this indeed. And you consider uh, and apply different temperatures, T1 and T2. You have two uncompensed currents, which should, in accordance to the ideas of Rostov, create, uh, evidently, you have dm over dt, and you will have magnetization current, which will, should produce some kind of Nernst effect. At the same time, you do not have um, the kinetic contribution when the states, electron states at the upper circle and uh, at the uh, lower circle are not at the um, uh, exactly coincide with Landau levels. So conductivity along the cylinder is zero. Uh, then to make this story, so this is a Gedanken experiment, to make this story more uh, practical, uh, which can be measured by experimentalists, we, we squeezed this cylinder in the Corbino disk. So imagine that I reduce a little bit uh, the upper circle, and then I squeeze it, and the geometry will be the following. I have Corbino disk, I have a conducting disk with magnetic field along its axis, and I have two types of H currents, external and internal, and the temperatures are different. Very good. So uh, I want to say that this is indeed realizable geometry because very recently uh, Aaron Kapitulnik published the paper where he proposed the cantilever torque magnetometry method for the measurements of whole conductivity of highly resistive samples. Now he is working on the application of the same a method to measure the predicted by, by us the Nernst effect. So let's consider the relation between the H current and the thermodynamic potential in the Corbino geometry. Uh, I can uh, write the corresponding to the currents and vector potential contribution to thermodynamical potential uh, to uh, derive from here current and it is easy to see that the H current in such system is proportional to the thermodynamic potential per square, uh, per one centimeter square divided magnetic field. Now, to return from the disk to Corbina disk, I just cut the central part and I find in a very general uh, thermodynamical case without the um, specification electrons or something else, the total current which will flow through the Corbino disk is determined by the difference of uh, thermodynamical potentials per square centimeter. Very good. Uh, now I can specify all four electrons. So the microscopic approach to calculation of the H currents is that I write the Hamiltonian, Landau Hamiltonian with shifted. So I forget about Corbino geometry. I consider it as a macroscopic one. So I will speak about the stripe, uh, about the strips. So uh, different temperatures, different sides results in different currents. We just saw it. How to calculate them microscopically? I will write magnetic uh, the Hamiltonian in magnetic field uh, with shifted 
um, minimum in Landau potential because it can be in any point. And then I study this problem. I found solution in uh, the Whittaker functions, and then I can uh, uh, solve the spectral problem and find how spectrum is constructed close to the edges. I will see that uh, when the center, when the minimum of potential is very close to the edge, so I will have just double uh, um, staircase of Landau levels with some small corrections. When I move potential far from the enough uh, LB is the magnetic length from the uh, edge of the strip. So I will return to Landau spectrum with some exponential corrections. Then I can write the density, local density of current, and I can calculate total current as the integral over all uh, widths of the strip. I can, and I can arrive to the integral of uh, x minus x zero multiplied square of wave function. Here, it is useful to uh, exploit Feynman theory, where I can relate this integral with the derivative of spectrum over the parameter x zero. Finally, all these calculations allow me to find expression for total current flowing in the strip with different temperatures at uh, the uh, end. Uh, in result, I see something very similar to the expression for thermodynamic potential. And indeed, when I apply the total current is H current along one H minus current along the second H, finally I arrive to the, the same formula as thermodynamic potential calculated in Landau uh, spectrum. Uh, I confirm the relation between total current and thermodynamic potential per centimeter square, which I showed you from very general thermodynamic relations. And this formula allows me to calculate total current in Corbino disk for two-dimensional electron gas and for graphene. You see that it is determined by square of chemical potential and in this case by the cube of chemical potential. Chemical potential in the magnetic field oscillates. And uh, the uh, kind of these oscillations which are related to the gas van Alphen oscillations is well known. In the result, we see the total current passing through uh, the disk becomes oscillating functions of two oscillation parts of chemical potential temperature T2 and T1. In the result, uh, if you have oscillating current in the ring, it produces oscillating magnetic field and the excess of it. So here you can see the uh, oscillations of total current in two-dimensional gas and in graphene, they are very different. And finally, we can recalculate oscillations of this current and then predict how will oscillate induced magnetic field and the axis of ring which is proposed for measurement. The measurement of such uh, oscillations of such specific nerve effect will be direct proof of the existing and importance of uh, the contribution to Nernst effect due to magnetization currents. Because here we completely excluded the kinetic part of the problem. All is determined only by thermodynamics. Thank you for your attention. This, where I would like to acknowledge that this work was supported by European Union Horizon 2020 Research and Innovation Programs COEXAN, which is already terminated, and Magenta. Uh, also, I would like to ask uh, to thank for hospitality of the Slate University in China. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for the interesting talk. And um, perhaps before we have time for a short question, I would like to remind everyone that at the end of every session, there is actually a conference picture, and it would be good if you stay and then. Uh,
um, switch on your video for a short moment. But now we have, uh, before this, we have uh, sh a short time for questions. Please uh, either use the raise hand button or, or write in the chat for questions. Perhaps in the meantime, I can already ask if you have your uh, Corvino geometry, how, how important is the, the gradient of the temperature uh, along the geometry? Uh, actually, due to uh, the this uh, uh, gradient, it appears the effect. effect is yeah, yeah, yes, but I mean that it's not, I mean, to say the shape of this, of course. It's, uh, uh, yeah, um, you see, uh, actually, we considered this, uh, uh, you noticed that I did not solve really the problem for yeah. Corbino. I did not take into account the curvature. So I considered that my uh, disk is much larger than the magnetic legs. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we used practically rectangular geometry, uh, uh, then connected in the, the disk. Uh, at the same time, we know that in nano rings, due to magnetic field, it appears persistent currents. And this current is also persistent. Mm -hmm. So uh, it is very interesting from my point of view to construct a bridge to see how macroscopic geometry uh, when you dec de diminish size of your ring, uh, and this is not so simple because you have different parameters, the size of your ring, magnetic uh, lengths, etc. So to uh, see the crossover between macro and nano. And uh, this is what we are doing now. And we see how uh, with the, uh, when, um, uh, this persistent current appears at what sizes, but this is still in... Uh, but, but now for the moment you just took the temperature changing basically linearly from... Uh, uh, yes, yes. Uh, okay, look, this is very good question actually. When I spoke about uh, Laughlin geometry, so it is not necessarily linearly, because uh, you, you could even consider two rings which are not connected at all. So you, uh, should, you should have temperature T1 and T2, but you did not say anything about the gradient. Of course, when we speak about the Corbina geometry and metallic ring, here we suppose that the difference is not um, very strong. So you have a linear response. So uh, nevertheless, uh, up to some point, our formulas are very generic. I mean that finally we expand over the difference, of, but we, uh, we can also do not do this. So in principle, it is not necessary. Like it is not necessary evidently in Laughlin geometry, in Corbino, you also can consider the strong uh, gradients, but um, uh, finally we expanded to get uh, the curves. Thank you. Is there some other question? If not, then thank you again. Then uh, yeah, and thank you also to all other speakers of this session. Then I think I would like to ask you to unshare your screen and everyone who is present